State Board of Education is called to order. I notice there are nine members present. We anticipate the arrival of the other one shortly. Uh, remind you that uh, we need to add right after the approval of the agenda the uh, ESSER discussions and the, the, the vote on the ESSER issues that we had yesterday. So with that being said, is there a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Dina makes that motion and Betty seconds that motion. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, the motion carries 9-1. And nine zero, and now it is time for our most exciting presentation. Now you got to do a bit pretty good, uh, uh, Doug, because you're followed by the teachers of the year. So we expect this to be an outstanding thing. Huh? He, is, he was joking that they have to be exciting. I was, I was pretty sure I already presented. Yeah. <laughs> we thought maybe you were the new teacher of the year, Doug, but... <laughs> well, that is the first thing on the agenda, so I, I know I was probably in the running at least once. Based on yesterday's uh, information and the stuff you've had overnight, a motion would be in order to approve ESSER 2 recommendations. Dina makes that motion. And a second. Betty seconds that motion. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? Abstain? Nine, uh, eight, one, eight, zero, one. Motion would be in order to approve the ESSER 3, both the change orders and the uh, new information that was presented over yesterday and overnight. Motion would be in order for that. Uh, Melanie and Ann. Further discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. Opposed? Abstain? Third motion and to set the deadline for December 16th, 16th uh, for submissions to ESSER 3. Uh, Jim and Dina make that motion. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? Abstain? 801. You did a tremendous job, uh, Doug, so and we much. certainly appreciate the enthusiasm, the enthusiasm and uh, energy uh, in this presentation, and you've set the bar pretty high for the Teachers of the Year. And don't neglect Tate. He also did. <laughs> I said that wrong. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you, Tate. Denise, I believe you have introductions to make. No Morning, Chairman Porter and board members. Um, so you all were here when they started their journey as the 2022 Kansas Teacher of the Year team. And today we're going to hear from them uh, about their experiences over the year and um, kind of what the program has brought for them. So I, what order are you all? We're gonna come together. Well, come on up. Please welcome the 2022 team. And I'm gonna let you guys, what'd you say? Mm -hmm. I know this has been an exciting year and there's been many highlights, but the, probably the biggest highlight is after this is over, we're going to want to take our pictures with you. <laughs> and we'll just ruin We're your reputation. We love photos. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, good morning, Chairman Porter and members of the board. Thank you so much for having us back. Um, we are the 2022 Kansas Teacher of the Year team. Um, in case you've forgotten, which I'm sure you have not, we're going to do some introductions because some of us have had some movement um, in our positions, and we just wanted to kind of introduce to you where we're at now. So my name is Suzanne Stevenson. I'm the 2022 Kansas Teacher of the Year, formerly a fourth grade teacher. Now I'm a, an ESOL instructional coach in Dodge City. We have Lori Tezius, who is a fourth grade teacher in Cheney. Um, Megan O'Neill, who could not be with us today, she is a fifth grade teacher in Florida, actually. Uh, we have Amanda Ketterling. She is a library media specialist in Bonner Springs and also an adjunct professor at Fort Hay State. We have Amber Carruthers, sorry, right behind me. Um, she's a high school ELA teacher at, in Hutchison. Lisa Martinez is an assistant principal at Scott Dual Language Magnet here in Topeka. Kristen Salazar is a CTE and business teacher in Goddard. And then Natalie is the Dean of Students and Restorative Justice Facilitator in KCK. Um, so may not be the same positions you saw us in in the beginning, but that's where we're at now. Um, my team and I are going to kind of give you an overview of what our year was like, some of the things that we did, and 
we'll go from there. Hello. So um, this is a timeline of the events. In March, we were nominated by our districts as Teacher of the Year. In May, we filled out our applications, which included five extensive essays, questions with essay responses, and three letters of recommendations that we submitted. In September, we had our regional awards banquet, but it was postponed due to COVID. Um, and so in March 2021, we had our um, regional banquets held via Zoom, which was interesting, but effective. Um, we were named, you know, region um, winners for Teacher of the Year for 2022. And then in September, we finally got together and had our state awards banquet where Suzanne was named Kansas Teacher of the Year and we were Regional Teachers of the Year. All right, here's an extensive kind of a just an overview of what we planned out in October and November. We quickly had to get together and decide what our theme was going to be. So we had various planning meetings, whether in person or Zoom. And then we also visited um, Fort Hay State and MNU for the Ed Rising Conference, where we actually got to present to future teachers. We also had our first college visit to K-State University. In December, we had a wonderful opportunity to participate in the Capturing Kids Heart Training in Wichita with the Flippin' Group. January through April was our busy times. We had district visits, and we visited all eight schools that we had, and we had tons of college visits also scheduled. In April, we had the opportunity to um, participate in the Kansas Leeds Conference, and then September of this year, we got to pass on the torch to the 22-23 um, Teacher of the Year. Um, we also got to do a presentation with the Teacher of the Promise and also had training for the new Teacher of the Year teams. This slide here shows, this slide here shows a map of all of the 23 colleges in the state of Kansas that offer teacher prep pro programs. We were able to attend 18 of them which was an awesome experience as we traveled around the state. <clears throat> in addition to the 18 college visits, we were also were able to present at Hutchinson Community College. Uh, Kristen mentioned the two Ed Rising events that we presented at. We also presented at um, two PD events. One was a multi-district presentation at Cordia, Concordia School District, and then another one at Ottawa School District. All together at the colleges, we um, were able to present to approximately 800, over 860 students. When you add in the potential high school students that we presented to at the colleges um, and all of the PD people, we actually presented to about 1,100 people. Our presentation was finding a place and space for all students in the world. Each of us had, we teamed up, there were two at a time, and we talked about the invisible backpack that kids carry with them, the heart of teaching, making connections, going beyond the safe place to a brave space, and then life after high school. So one of our most memorable moments was when we got to present uh, before the legislator. And even prior to that, we uh, had meetings where we discussed many issues in education with our commissioner, a deputy commissioner, other KSD leaders, and so forth. And so some of our passion topics that we advocated for uh, was about teacher retention, which is very important, advocating for more educators of color in Kansas, as well as college access and better mental health supports. Um, and that culminated with us being able to be recognized in the Kansas State Chamber, which made the experience even more rewarding to represent, you know, Kansas educators. And so for this moment, here we are, we're back again. <laughs> you can see us there. And we are once again sharing our passion uh, for what makes us tick as educators. And that experience culminated with us being the recipient of an educational credit to further education with the Learning Quest 529 plan on behalf of our state treasurer. So during our spring semester um, of 2022, we were able to immerse ourselves into each other's worlds by touring and experiencing each other's district magic. 
We started in Kristen's district of Goddard where we pumped up with pep assemblies, were inspired by art, and chilled out in a very cool sensory room. Then we traveled to the other side of Kansas to Natalie's district of Shawnee Mission where we walked with an alligator, watched a fire rescue run through, and dined at an exquisite student-run restaurant. Next, we rolled over to Amanda's district of Bonner Springs, where we had many heart-happy student interactions with Pope's Pals breakfast delivery treats, fourth grade student-led tours, and created Mahomes Gnomes with the high school life school students. Then we trekked back over to the western side of Kansas to Suzanne's Dodge City District, where we were ordained sheriffs by Miss Kitty, climbed a library tree house, and stomped with the ROTC. The following day, we shuffled over to Amber's district in Hutchinson, where we were inspired by student leadership with their sweet treat and mini sweet treat, and the closet where they meet all of their students' needs. On the road again, we went to Megan's Ottawa district, where we played drums and parachutes with the students, and we were serenaded by their amazing band and choir. We traveled back to the middle of Kansas once again to Lori's district of Cheney, where cardinal love is everywhere, from bus driver Bob to battle bots to nursery rhymes with pre-K. Finally, we wrapped up our tour with a drive over to Lisa's district of North Topeka, where the SHS show choir performance boosted our energy. We went on a date with a book, and we were inspired by Lisa's real-world Spanish lesson. Being able to experience these amazing districts that all of these exemplar teachers work in was an experience that we will never forget. Yeah, that's me. So beyond the district visits and all of the college visits, we had some other um, conferences and just opportunities layered throughout our experience. So um, our first one um, up there at the top was at the Capturing Kids Hearts um, conference down in Wichita. And I was not so sure about that one when we were going in, just because of the name. As a high school teacher, it wasn't so, in, it sounded a little mushy to me, but boy, did we learn a lot. We learned um, so many uh, tools, um, brain break type of things, relationship building type of things uh, that I think that all of us were able to go back and implement into our classrooms uh, and even our schools uh, overall. Uh, in Wichita again, no, in Emporia, at Emporia State University, um, Kristen, Lori, and Amanda were able to attend the KATM conference, which is for teachers of mathematics, and they were able to do um, a, a new presentation for those groups, which was really, really fun for them, and I think very inspiring. Um, one of our favorite things, I. I think is when we got together with all of educators from all around Kansas at the Kansas Leeds uh, conference in Wichita, we were able to invite teacher colleagues to come with us and and we went around and we were able to network and experience um, the the Oh, the, the, the various niches that uh, all of these other teachers had, and it was really inspiring. Tabitha Rossbury was also there and did a presentation on conscious discipline that I think touched a lot of people. Um, and then finally, we just passed the torch, as we said earlier, um, to our new KTOY 2023 group. And that included presenting to all of the district nominees, as well as the semifinalists and finalists, uh, spending one-on-one -on -one time with our team and the new team, and then um, doing a really nice workshop for the Teachers of Promise, who are pre-service teachers nominated by their school districts to attend this event. And then finally, with the just wrapping up and attending the banquet um, and really just giving the whole thing over to the next, next team to see what they're gonna do with it. So like Lisa mentioned, um, we, did what we could to train the next Kansas Teacher of the Year team. Um, the man in the middle right here, that's Brian Skinner. He's your 2023 Kansas Teacher of the Year. And I have to tell you, this team is phenomenal. 
they are going to absolutely blow your socks off. Um, you know, we, we've all been through the process. We understand the value that you all place on Kansas educators and that KSDE does to support educators. And we were so, so happy to help pass that torch to them and let them know that as Kansas educators, they are celebrated, they are supported, and they have everything that they need to go out and advocate for not only students in the profession, but teachers, as well as future teachers in the profession. Um, so lastly, we just wanna say a quick thank you for giving us this opportunity, for giving us a place to come back home to, and for all of the support and everything that you have given us um, throughout this journey. We've had incredible opportunities to learn from not only each other, but from incredible districts, incredible teachers across the state, principal superintendents. I mean, the list goes on and on, really. Um, one last thing I wanna leave you with. Um, when the 2020 team kind of trained us on how to, how to be the Kansas Teacher of the Year team, they said, you know, how are you gonna leave your message? And so as a team, we decided that our message is we rise by lifting others, and that's what we've strived to do in this role. Um, and so the way that we leave our message is giving people stickers. So I have a sticker for all of you, um, just as a reminder that in order for us to rise, we have to lift those around us. So we'll open it up for questions now if, if anybody needs anything. As has always been the case, you are inspiring. And we thank you for doing that. But most of all, what we thank you for doing is making a difference in the lives of kids that you touch every day. Uh, that is something that's always impressed me about, and I, I refer to you as rock stars, you know, most of you this morning. Uh, the, and you are representative of hundreds and thousands of other rock stars that are making a difference every day. I really appreciate what you said about being advocates and teaching others to be advocates. We need that desperately. Uh, I, I view that we are in a crisis as far as education is concerned in Kansas, and and what you are recommending and what you are advocating is absolutely essential. If we are going to meet our vision that Kansas leads the world in the success of each student, we have to honor each student, but we have to honor each teacher. Actually, every bus driver and every cafeteria worker and every paraprofessional and everything. Uh, and we need to make sure that we, uh, us and you and everybody that you touch, that we touch, are aware of that and are doing everything they can to help us meet the needs of students. And that cannot be done unless we honor and support the people that are in the classroom every day. Pardon me, I got, I'm getting old. <laughs> Melanie. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Porter. Congratulations, but also thank you, because you guys have taken on something. I don't think that people necessarily realize how much work this is. You signed up for something extra. You were already leading, and then you said, I'm willing to do more. And I, I love this sticker so much. Uh, so I do have a question for whoever wants to answer it, which is what advice would you give teachers who are nominated? And then I, I think there's, there's a point where you have to make a decision about whether you want to move forward or not, right? What does that look like? Well, the thing that I would say to teachers that are nominated is say yes. Whatever level of Teacher of the Year nominee you are, whether it's district <coughs> nominee, regional finalist, semi-finalist, or Kansas Teacher of the Year, say yes. Um, I have, as the 2022 State Teacher of the Year, I have had the opportunity to coordinate and kind of collaborate with all State Teachers of the Year, and over and over and over, they are coming to me as the Kansas Teacher of the Year saying, your program is phenomenal, how do we make our state program better? So, and that goes for every, like I said, every level of nominee. Um, you know, we all have families, we all have obligations, we're already so overbooked because, because we are servant leaders in reality. But at some point we have to pour back into ourselves and this Kansas Teacher of the Year program is the perfect opportunity to pour back into yourself. Love that, thank you. Dina. Well, I'm Dina. <laughs> Your voice is lowered over there. <laughs> okay, Jim, moving along. <laughs> Uh, congratulations and thank you for your service and for your advocacy during this past year. Uh, 
not everybody doesn't have to jump up, but uh, what was the biggest surprise to you as you went out into the field and, and met with the educators and students and communities uh, on your tours? What, what surprised you or what would stood out? I, something that surprised me in, in the best of ways was um, being regarded as somebody who had something to say. Um, everywhere we went, um, there were people who genuinely wanted to hear what we had to think. And so it was just such a pleasure to be able to express that, especially on behalf of all of the people that we are representing in education. I would say that. And you realize that that doesn't end today, that for the rest of your career, you'll be somebody that people respect. Uh, and, and, and I encourage you to say it. <laughs> Anybody else want to respond? <laughs> I said this in my speech at the K-Toy Bank, but, but something that surprised me, um, and I'm just going to give a shout out to Cheney again, um, just the love and support that the Cheney community had for their teachers and their students. Um, I know Cheney is a relatively small district, but it was, as an outsider, I could feel the love in Cheney, and so just, again, a huge shout out and thank you to everyone in Cheney that helped put our district visit together, because that was surprising in the in the most beautiful way sorry i just want to add something uh this opportunity opened so many doors for so many of us like amanda's teaching classes at fort hayes uh, natalie and suzanne and lisa all have new jobs some of us still have our same positions but like um i'm i'm teaching classes for wichita state and that wouldn't have happened if i we wouldn't have gone to wichita state and i would have saw my former advisor um, and I'm being inducted in their Hall of Fame next week. So, like, there's just so many. I, I don't want to, like, toot on my own horn. But everyone here has, like, done something phenomenal. And it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have happened if it weren't for this experience. So, anyway, I get you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now you're thinking of them. Um, when we went to our training um, the very first day, we learned about imposter syndrome. Um, and I have that huge. So I think this experience has really given me more confidence, ability to speak and not pass out. <laughs> um, but also like just belief in that you are valuable and what you have to say is important um, and it's not going to end here. Um, taking chances I probably would not have done otherwise. Um, having the opportunity just to go visit other districts has been amazing for me. Sometimes you get in that little shell, oh, this is what my district does. <laughs> And going out and seeing what other districts do, amazing programs across the state here. Um, I, every one of them gave me something exciting to take back to my class. And same thing with my teaching as a career class. I'm trying to show that excitement to our future educators of what is outside the walls of Goddard. So I've been inspired. <laughs> So something that was really encouraging to me was as we went across Kansas and we went to various universities, uh, it made me feel good to see the commitment toward um, advocating and having diversity, equity, and inclusion programs uh, so that all students can feel represented. And so as we went from place to place and we talked um, to various individuals, there was a real commitment there and a passion for that, uh, because that is something that I have always been passionate about, as you know from listening to my speech. I think the thing that was encouraging to me was when we went to the college visits, how many teacher prep students are out there that are excited about getting into education. And so I was encouraged by that number because we hear a lot about that, you know, we don't have anybody going into education. And we reached out to a lot of students and they were excited about going into education. They have that passion. We just have to continue to encourage them to get into the classroom. There are a lot of tremendous things going on. One of, the one of the things you say, you don't like to toot your own horn. I think that's part of the problem is that there are tremendous things going on in every school uh, that is not being well known. And so I'd encourage you to toot away and encourage everybody else to do the same thing because uh, the message needs to be out there. There are outstanding things happening in every school in Kansas 
and that is not being communicated, and we need to communicate that message. You may, Commissioner. Well, congratulations again. Great to see all of you. Suzanne, I want to come back to the f first question I think that uh, the board posed, which was, you know, what would you tell people that maybe have been nominated? I'm going to reverse, because you talked about servant leadership, and I see this so much as I travel, is that teachers are just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm just a teacher. I don't have a voice, right? Lisa, you mentioned that. I don't even want to be nominated because I don't feel worthy. To, I, I don't want that on me. Can you just speak to that? Because I think it speaks to the profession that we have to advocate for, right? So yeah. Talk to that a little And that's bit. something that I'm seeing as an instructional coach now, too. I get to be in more classrooms, and there are great, great things happening in all classrooms across our state, but teachers don't want to share that. And that's something that we have to kind of break the mold of. We have to be very purposeful about providing praise to teachers and encouraging them. We rise by lifting others, right? We have to lift others up so that they can share the amazing things that are happening in their classrooms and give them, I want to say the permission, but they don't need our permission. Sometimes it feels like we need other people's permission to toot our own horn to say all the great things that we're doing. But I would say, you know, if you're in a position to see greatness, call out greatness. Let it be known that it's there um, because it's happening. But sometimes, like you said, we don't have the, the language, the ability, the, the belief that what we're doing is great. And as Mr. Porter says so often, and you've learned, if you don't tell this, your story, the teachers don't tell the story. It's being written for you by people that don't set foot in the classroom because, you know, we all went to school and that's our memory of school. And as you have seen, as you visited even each other's classrooms, whoa, there's a difference and there's great things, but you don't even, you don't even get to see that every day, much less people that aren't in the profession. So thank you for encouraging people to tell your story, tell the teacher's story and, and advocate. And I also, on behalf of my colleagues, we congratulate you and honor you for the great things that you've done. And now we're going to take pictures, and we'll be right here in front of this. And I need to remind the board members that this is not a break. We're going to come right back and go to work. <laughs> okay, everybody get up. <laughs>
Dev, Lou Ann Barron is here. Welcome, Lou Ann, and we are ready to hear the update. Excellent, thank you. All right, good morning everyone. In listening to the Kansas Teacher of the Year, I was reflecting about my daughter-in-law is currently in her first year teaching at Bonner Springs. And I'm so happy. Uh, she was in the finance field and she made a career switch to become an elementary teacher. So that just really warms my heart. So this quarterly report, uh, I've decided to share some data about the Kansas School for the Deaf. So this will be a little uh, bit heavy laden with data, and there's some pictures. On this front page, you see our new logo. It is now official. It was a collaborative project by stakeholders, staff, the deaf community, voted on this new logo. So that is our new current logo. We had a huge homecoming weekend this previous weekend. We had a huge pep rally, so that's some of the pictures on this first page. We had class reunions. We had a huge volleyball tournament, a football game, award ceremonies. So we had approximately three to 400 people come to campus over the weekend. Uh, and it was wonderful to feel like everything's coming back to life after the previous three years when we couldn't have hold events due to the pandemic. So it was great to see the young students involved in our pep rally as they marched around the gym. I wanted to show some data over time in terms of student enrollment. As you notice, we're maintaining at a fairly high number. Uh, we were at 154, we dropped to 150, and we're projecting that we'll be back to uh, 155. Uh, last year, we had about 150 students plus 30 students who were on a waiting list, as I shared with you previously, uh, and that was because we didn't have enough dorm staff to allow those 30 students who were on the waiting list to enroll until we were able to fill those positions. Um, and we filled some of those positions and some of those students have decided to stay in their home district. Um, we were hoping for an enrollment of about 190, but that didn't happen. In terms of dorm coverage, we have been able to fill most of our vacant positions, so that way we can allow more students to come and reside in our dorm living space. And that allows them to have a true language immersive experience on campus. Our extended school year enrollment, or ESY enrollment, has been very robust and successful. We've had enough staff, just barely. I know with the teacher shortage that continues to be ongoing and then as well as para shortages, uh, I know a lot of school districts have a lot of vacancy in that position, but we were able to provide ESY to anyone who wanted to come. We didn't turn down any student from that. Uh, so any student can come to that. Uh, they don't have to be a student at KSD during the school year. So we have, we're at 100 and we expect 105 or more this coming summer. Our outreach staff has been to all of these counties in blue on, on the map. We're providing services to students in all of these counties. We added two new counties in this last year, down in the southwest corner of the state. It was Grant and Stevens counties. Those are our two newest counties that we've uh, made contact with and we were helping to provide services there. You see kind of the northwest area or a few other uh, areas, counties that are remain white, it means that either they don't have any students who are deaf, hard of hearing, or they don't wish to have our support services or they don't want us to uh, be a support to them that they're providing their own services. So we're hoping to make further contact in the Northwest area of the state. 
This spring, I'm planning to attend all of the KC regional meetings to present and talk about all of the programs that we offer, the supports that we can provide, and so I plan to go on a tour this spring. This last summer, that Casey board meeting asked for us to go. They invited us to attend, uh, and they asked for a video of your programs so that we can get a vision of what you have to offer. And we said, all right, that'll become one of our projects. So we have been working on a video, and I have uh, the highlights of that video at the end of my presentation for today. So it's exciting work that we continue to do, and we believe that it's critical to support the school district's parents and families, and we plan to continue that effort. Uh, and in terms of the, the number of students that we've served through our outreach department, this is as of last May. This is program-specific data through our outreach department. Altogether, our outreach has served a total of 658 students, but by program, our, our hearing assistive technology program, that's the highest bar on this graph. So that's FM systems that go into hearing aids, hearing aid repair, uh, cochlear implant consultations, our audiologist travels throughout the state, dropping off equipment that we're on loaning out, providing training, talking about uh, how to troubleshoot if a child's uh, amplification device is not working, does it need a battery change, is there some other type of uh, repair that's needed. And so that's a huge number. Uh, 290 students receive that service. Our language assessment program, um, we're really excited. We already provided 155 assessments. That number is going up as we speak. That was the number as of last May. With the SGF funds that we received from the legislature for birth to three, they fully funded birth to three services. Uh, that'll be through ARPA funds for this year, and then it'll become a part of our base budget moving forward. So I won't have to ask the legislature for more money for that. For Children ages three to eight, uh, in the beginning we had some concerns from special ed directors because we initiated a fee-for-service plan. So there was some um, noise about that, about school districts having to pay. But since that uh, has happened, um, student, school districts have signed agreements for us to come in and go ahead and assess uh, their students. And so it's been a little bit quiet. We still have three lap specialist positions to fill. And if the governor uh, approves that, uh, then we hope to advertise, um, or, or we, when we had the governor's approval, we tried to advertise in July. That's not the best time to advertise. So we're trying to do uh, some further advertising of those lap specialist positions and get those filled so we can do more. Our Sound Start program is our birth to three early intervention services, and we are serving 147 children there and still growing. Um, that's part, uh, that's growing so much in conjunction with LAP. And so we're realizing through the assessment process, these children need more services and parents need more resources. And so they are ca contacting our Sound Start team and calling out our Sound Start team to help provide uh, some services. The other smaller bar bars, uh, most of those are grant-funded programs, and they're limited funds, limited amounts, and so the numbers are lower there. So we're trying to find some money so that we can expand those programs, especially the Deaf Mentor and the Family Science Kansas classes that provide ASL instruction for families. So students receiving access to Deaf-appropriate interventions, programs, and resources has really gone up from 453 to uh, 671 over the years. We've received lots of contacts, whether that be for an individual child or family needs. So we've seen increases there, and we recognize the challenge that we have right now 
Um, it, our challenge is staff. We need more staff. Uh, so for fiscal year 24, I requested funds to add additional staff so that we can provide increased support to all families throughout the state. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, that gets approved in this year. I'm asking for three new positions to support our outreach department in our early intervention, as well as a teacher of the deaf to support others statewide. Uh, thinking about how we do outreach to support teachers of the deaf throughout the state. Some school districts don't have any licensed teacher for the deaf. So we could come and provide some mentoring or some instructional coaching. So when we go work with that, uh, we're currently going into Cali County right now, kind of piloting this, uh, working with their team. They have a lot of deaf kids in Cali County. They're, but they're in different buildings. And so we're looking at, is it possible to develop a center-based program so that they currently don't have a teacher of the deaf, but if they had a teacher of the deaf, rather than being itinerant, going to uh, all these different buildings for 20 and 30 minutes at a time, uh, it could be better improved in terms of delivery if there was a center-based program in one building with the teacher supporting all the students from the district. So we're working with that county presently. I'm pretty excited about that. It's a, as I said, it's a pilot. If we find that to be successful, that could become a model for the rest of the state. In the birth to three population, we also see another huge jump um, from previously in 2020, 130 up to, we're projecting 150. Again, we believe this is due to our language assessment program, more individuals becoming aware of access, how children learn, and how deaf children learn being different from hearing children. Um, some have some auditory access, and so then ensuring that we're providing uh, access supports for a variety of needs whether that be visual or auditory. So I'm projecting that we're gonna see another big increase uh, in terms of uh, when more babies are born, we're gonna see this number continue to rise. Our graduation rate is stable at 100%. Um, that's good news. I always uh, look at our graduation rate. Really for our students, it's essential they have to have a diploma in order to find a job. Uh, and so we really push our students, we really work through retention. During COVID, we almost lost a few students um, due to dropouts uh, because it was so hard during masks and to maintain adequate language access there. Um, but we made it through and everybody graduated, so that was a huge relief. So we hope to maintain that 100% uh, level this spring. I want to take time uh, here to talk about transition. We're noticing that in the period of COVID, it appears that our students have lost interest in going to higher ed. So that percentage has dropped uh, precipitously. So we're trying to figure out how to build that. But some of them come back for post-grad, which is our K-STAR program. So we hope to, to continue that to encourage students to go to community college or to go to uh, some college program once they've completed the K-STAR program. Um, but it seems we've lost some motivated students. I think it was due to COVID, uh, and we're trying to bring that back, uh, help encourage their interests in attending some sort of post-secondary program. This data is a little bit old. You know, in May they graduate and they don't necessarily have a plan yet. So we haven't followed up with our 2022 bar uh, to see if they're still in college. So we do need to do some follow-up uh, to see if they're still, those who in previous classes went to college, if they're still uh, in college. So I have a feeling that this data may change as we do some follow-up with our alumni.
This data is a little different. I've been keeping track of our licensed teachers and what type of licensure they have. <coughs> to work at a school for the deaf, you're required to be duly licensed in both a content area as well as deaf ed. So that's the goal for when we offer our reports to the state. So we're trying to increase and help support teachers who already have one license to get their second license. After the pandemic, those numbers dropped. We had to hire teachers with either a content license or a deaf ed license because we desperately needed teachers. And so we're hopefully supporting them using some ESSER funds to become fully licensed in whichever area they need that secondary license, whether that be content or deaf ed. So my goal is to bring that up so that anyone who works with deaf children, they are duly licensed and fully qualified to teach deaf, hard of hearing children. I thought I'd share a few more pictures from our big homecoming weekend last weekend. On the top row, the gentleman with I Love You, that is a deaf rapper from Chicago named Matthew Maxey. The students were in awe to have a deaf rapper on campus. Uh, and he's very popular. Many of our students do like music. Some people think deaf people enjoy music, but yes, in fact, we love music. Even if you can't hear well, you can feel the vibrations. And this deaf rapper made the music visual, right, through ASL and also with the vibrations. It was a really cool experience that day. In the middle, our volleyball team won a tournament championship at the Spike Out tournament in Indiana. That was uh, a week and a half ago. The third picture on top is our homecoming royalty. Our football team unfortunately lost the game, but that's okay. Uh, the bottom middle is our Great Plains Schools for the Deaf volleyball tournament. We recently earned second place in that tournament, uh, and so it was just a great weekend. And it had a sense of everything being back to normal and very celebratory. It was great to have everyone back on campus. So finally, I want to briefly show, this is just a brief video clip. that Casey wants us to work on, right? So we're still completing our video tour, but this is a quick glimpse. These are uh, some pieces that we're putting on. It's a draft that will undergo further revision and editing. The f this is just a minute le in length. The full video will be seven minutes. Plus we'll be able to uh, have each program give some presentation in ASL and English. So if Families want to know about birth to three services. So they can click on birth to three and watch that video with captions or a voiceover. We haven't decided quite yet. Uh, we also need to figure out the Spanish speaking piece and then also English. So if parents want to check out our program, uh, this will be very visual and then accessible to anybody who, who wants to see it. So again, this is the quick glimpse one minute version. Oh, what did I do? There we go.
And that, that is the quick glimpse. Again, we're gonna be including some more information about our elementary school, our outreach departments, and so on and so forth. And this will be fully accessible for parents. So in the past, we would uh, offer campus tours and uh, that became disruptive to the classrooms and very distractive. And so we're shifting to a video for more of a virtual tour of campus. So that's our goal. That concludes my presentation for today. I'm open for questions. You mentioned that, uh, that you had a waiting list. If you were fully staffed, what is your capacity? Our full capacity for our dorms, I think we could house 200 students. Uh, our classrooms can, uh, can hold more than that, but our residence life is 200. And I say that because uh, we just had the GPSD volleyball tournament and we had almost 200 uh, and everybody had a bed. So I'm gonna guess uh, c true capacity, full capacity is 200 in our classrooms. We could accommodate more than 200 students on campus Day, combining day students as well as residence life. So if you had, if you were fully staffed, you could meet the needs of everyone on the waiting list. Correct. Thank you. Now the next thing is a statement. I am very impressed with what you're doing for outreach. Uh, I, th I see that as a tremendous improvement and want to just congratulate you on that. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, you know, we still have a lot more work to do through outreach, so. And, and at least we'd like to be able to reach out and make contact with all deaf, hard of hearing students across the state. Well, thank you. No, Dina, or is that Jim? It's actually me this time. I don't know, Jim may wanna tag on, but um, I wondered how many uh, deaf students potentially across the state do we? Jens, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, I often talk about our staff, but I don't show them to you, and there, it's rare that they're all together. We took a photo at the beginning of the year celebrating who we are as one school. And as you look at this, this photo, it's comprised, of course, support staff, instructional assistants, our outreach team, and, and our um, dorm staff, our instructional staff all together. <clears throat> One of the challenges is keeping everybody together and saying, this is our goal, this is our mission, and this is your role in that mission. This is the important work that you do. But I couldn't be more proud of the people that we've assembled. Luann referenced that, um, that it's hard to find staff, and, and it is in a sense. And we all know the teacher shortages are out there, but for us, when we have an opening, we do pretty well. Teachers want to work for us, and I, I take that as a sign that we're doing something right, that they find a culture there that they like to be a part of, and they want to be a part of. In fact, we often get calls saying, hey, do you have any positions in, at your school or in outreach? I'd like to be a part of that, so I, th I think that's a good sign. Some of the new staff we we welcomed this year in terms of instructional staff. Um, Sarah Martin, who's uh, an orientation mobility specialist, who's doing great work both on and off campus. Lydia Knopp, who's our new makerspace coordinator. I'll talk about our STEM programs. We're pushing really hard in STEM. She also coordinates our mobile STEM unit. Um, Laura Mitchell is an orientation mobility uh, specialist and TSVI and Shalann Thompson joined us in our field service as well. So we're excited to have those new staff, kind of an example of new, young, energetic people who want to work with us. Our goals have not changed since 2017, since Dr. Brian Jordan came down as part of the CASB study way back, way back in 2017, but we've stuck with those goals. And, and continue to do that. We will uh, evolve KISA in the process we went through in KISA in saying maybe it's time to revisit or add to those goals or take some off the plate. <clears throat> but they've served us very well and it's served as a guide star for us to say this is where we're going. These are the things that you as a board wanted us to impact and, and what we continue to focus on. I asked, and I want to thank uh, Barbara Hughes for, for handing out the annual report. We have gotten to the habit of doing an annual report for our school. 
Um, and that should be in front of you or should have been sent to you at some point. So everything I talk about here this morning is in greater detail in that report. I uh, encourage you to read that and ask any questions about it if you would like. We did complete our uh, KISA uh, visitation. Our outside visitation team came in on September 29th, and we were lucky to have the same members through all six years of the process. We took a, a break or uh, a waiver, I guess, as, as we would say in that, that COVID year. But we had representation from higher ed, K-12, a superintendent from K-12, and then we had a, a specialist in vision who was part of our team and understands the unique work that we do. So that report will be written and submitted, and then it'll come before you uh, shortly. Um, and again, what we want to do with that KISA is evolve that into say, let's, let's do some strategic planning. Let's go back to our stakeholders. Let's revisit what we said in 2017. Are we still on track? Are there some new things? And I think there are some new things that we want to do. Um, I'll get into some of our programs that we think are very strong and, and we're having very good success with. Our extended school year, many people know this is summer school, <clears throat> but it is not a camp. These, these are skills that we know that our kids need. And we had over 100 students supply. We were limited on space on our campus, our dormitories, we, even though we went back to grouping kids in dorms. Uh, we were at capacity. We could not accept anymore for summer school. We did open, reopen a site in Hayes, which is nice for kids who can't come to Kansas City or don't want to go that far for summer school. And we'd like to expand this program. One of the things in our budget enhancement is requesting about $300,000 for more summer school experiences for kids. We know they need those. And partnerships are really important. They don't have to come to our campus. Working at Fort Hayes State has been a very nice collaboration. We'd like to expand that to other colleges or universities. Um, and that really just is going strictly to teacher salaries um, over the summer. We hire teachers for that beyond just our own staff, so that's what the money would be used for. We do lots of back-to-school activities, and part of our mission is to educate the general public and, and uh, teachers who are not in our field to say, how do I work with kids who are blind or low vision? They're going to be in your classes, we say, so it's a, a good idea to have some general tips to know how to work with them. Edi anything from etiquette to uh, Braille and tactile graphics, technology. What are these things, and how can you as a teacher help those students access your curriculum, your teaching? Because we want those kids to be exposed to rigorous learning, but they can't be if they can't access that. And many teachers don't understand what, why a tactile graphic is important or why Braille on time matters or how technology can play a role in that. So we, we put this together in the summer. This was, I think, down uh, with Greenbush. Our friends from Greenbush did a, a session uh, in August. STEM, I mentioned STEM. We're hitting this hard, and this is kind of a messy slide, but it, it, it kind of encapsulates where we're at all over the board and hitting it hard because I believe this is where opportunities exist for our kids, where they're maybe not included in those fabulous CTE programs and, and rigorous academic programs that are offered in public schools. We need to show that our kids can be a part of that learning. So our partnership with Make 48, I mentioned this in the spring, that is on track. It will happen December 2nd through 4th on our campus in partnership with Make 48 but also with local businesses and designing um, an inventors competition, really, where we're going to bring the best and the brightest from our state, kids who are blind, visually impaired, transition age, basically 14 and up, to be a part of this day. It'll be two, two days of, of design thinking, inventing, sharing, presenting, working in groups, and working with businesses to say, this is what life is, this is what jobs are, in, the, in this economy. You have to have these skills. We're thrilled to do it. Maybe for other schools, they say, well, that's not a big deal. It's a big deal for us to have this kind of partnership and this opportunity. Winners go on to a national competition in Kansas City the following year. It'll be filmed as part of a PBS television show. So our kids will get exposure and they will be recognized as competent and able to participate in this kind of learning. Our TEALS computer science program, very small. At times, uh, it's been on you know, life support in the last couple of years because it's very small, and you have to convince people this is where you need to be. This is where our kids need to be in this rigorous learning and, and in a totally accessible program. Only school for the blind in the country to offer an accessible online course using Python in conjunction with Microsoft TEALS. Microsoft will write a report for, for their company, and they'll, they'll share that broadly 
about our program and our students, and I look forward to sharing that with you because we've had some real good success. We're now offering it not only to Kansas students, but students from other states. Uh, our, our partnership with the Casey Art Institute, uh, Dr. Chris Chapin brings his students over to our makerspace and says, we'd like to partner and learn from you, and we, we'd like to learn from them. We send students to a space camp in Huntsville, Alabama, totally accessible, kind of a life-changing experience for some of those kids. In the uh, bottom right, you can see a student floating there in space. They climb uh, large poles, they um, dive underwater and do all sorts of things that they would never have an opportunity to do. Our podcasting uh, is another accessible, uh, high interest program that we offer to all kids. And it's now broadcast on one Kansas City, one KC radio uh, in partnership. We've had some people approach us and say, we'd like to sponsor that. Um, so highly unusual and, and very successful. Families is where we want to go next. I think it's, it cannot be overemphasized. We've got to connect with families and talk about advocacy and the skills that their, their kids need to compete and to be successful in, in, this, uh, in this era. Some of the ways we're doing that, we are sending activity boxes to families. We say inside this box that we will send to you free of charge are educational and accessible activities, often focused on STEM literacy, things like that, and we can't make them fast enough. We have to shut off uh, uh, the sign-up sheet at 60. We forgot to s shut it off yesterday, and we had more, more parents wanting more boxes, so um, been very successful. Um, we also include tactile uh, games, 3D games that families can do together uh, in the evening or whenever they would like, and it also includes simulations so parents understand what does it mean to be low vision? What does it mean to have glaucoma? What does it mean to have peripheral vision loss. So these are educational activities and it helps parents connect with their own children and understand the disability. Uh, I mentioned coffee. I was talking to, I think, Melanie about coffee. It's become an industry sort of thing for us. I love coffee as, a, as an aside, but, but really we have our higher level students making espresso machines two days a week and learning business skills and social skills. But then we also have our Project Life students, students with more significant disabilities running a coffee cart and they're designing their own logo and they're, they're roasting their own beans and they're packaging and labeling and selling and then partnering with some local businesses to get that to market and, and to learn how it works on a large scale. So we're thrilled about that. Um, a great way to incorporate academic skills and functional skills uh, into their routine. Transition, uh, it's hard, hard to move students from high school to, to success post-secondary, especially if you have a disability. We know our post-secondary success rate isn't where we want it to be, including for our own kids. One of the things we started was a, a Project Search, only the second school for the blind in the country to partner with Project Search, which has been around about 25 years, giving students with developmental delays the opportunity to work in community-based businesses in rotations, learning specific skill sets on a business site that they build a portfolio and then they can move from that to employment. About 80% of their graduates in this program do become employed, which is pretty remarkable. So we have five students working right now in partnership with the Greater Kansas City YMCA's. Every uh, four days a week, they go on site all day, pack their own lunch, show up, do the job, and then report back and discuss how are we doing? What did we learn today? And, and KSHB 41 came out and did a story on us a few weeks ago. I think I shared that uh, with you. But we're proud of that program and are always looking for more partners. Uh, our Trailblazer Weekend, we're calling our Boys and Girls Weekend the Trailblazer Weekend. We did this in conjunction with our 5K on September 24th. We had about 30 students come from across the state and participate in that. And uh, we had a few board members. Thank you for, for coming to that. Um, it was great to have kids out front with their canes uh, walking, running, leading in that community. That draws a lot of attention, a positive attention to our school. Uh, White Cane Day is officially October 15th, but we're, gonna, we're just going to celebrate it all week. So we started yeah, uh, Monday with a kickoff, a presentation from uh, Mr. Tim Hornick, who's a, a veteran who became blinded uh, in service. And he talked to our students, not only our students, but students and teachers across the state. We'd like to get our kids to the Capitol, and I, I made some, some overtures to say, how do we get there when they're in session so we can celebrate mobility, uh, technology, empowerment, what our kids can do. So we're looking to do that once the session begins after January. But, but we'll celebrate this all week. Um, um, 
the photo is not Mr. Hornick. It's actually our teacher, Mr. Christian Pewitt, who uh, was out at the state fair and uh, came across one of our fans. So it was a great picture, a way to celebrate white cane use. We do a large symposium for teachers. We're just not, just not teachers. We're, we're professional development specialists in some way. We take that obligation seriously. And um, November 11th in Wichita, we've gone so big. We used to be in Salina. It's gotten bigger. We invite administrators. We invite regular ed teachers. We invite vision teachers, paraprofessionals, anybody really wants to come. So we're at 124 just today, and I suspect that'll get a little bit larger. But that'll be a day of totally learning about vision, right? So many of our teachers work in public schools, and they get very good in-service on lots of other things, but typically they're not going to do the depth uh, of in-service that we can provide in vision. So we're proud to do that. Low vision, about 85% of our, uh, our population is low vision. They're not totally blind. They have some typical uh, vision. And so we need to talk about low vision. We do low vision clinics across the state. We're doing something called low vision on the road where we take equipment. We invite teachers, students in, talk about what that means, uh, why low vision examinations are important, how you can access them. We talk about vision screening. We're involved in the vision screening and training that's, that's going on across the state. We conduct those trainings. And then as, as an example, uh, Saturday, our, our staff came in this past Saturday and, and met with the Pediatric Alliance, and there were 25 participants. These are occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech, early childhood specialists, and actually a professor of, of occupational therapy came in and learned about low vision from our teachers. And the connections that come from that are pretty remarkable because we can talk about referral, we can talk about identification, we can talk about services and how we can reach young, young children uh, across the state. Cortical visual impairment is a big thing. It's probably the leading cause of blindness and, and many, even our own professionals often don't know enough about it. Many parents are becoming very well educated and want people who know how to address cortical vision impairment. So we have two groups that do ongoing learning. One is Discover CVI for parents. This is actually a parent-led group that we sponsor and support. And then the CVI Think Tank, which is just for vision professionals and others who want to learn about CVI. This is our outreach team. Again, I talk about these folks. They're the best in the business as far as I'm concerned. And, and some of the, the large hearts are where they, where they live and, and work. And we've grown this, this crew to 17, and I would like more, to be honest with you. In fact, I'm going to ask for more. I would like 10 more vision specialist professionals to serve kids across the state, especially birth to three. But our numbers have skyrocketed in this, in this way. We are making tremendous inroads. We continue to offer these services and to reach out to say, how can, how can we help you? You can see some of the data here. The color of, of the counties themselves are just the population of the, of the counties. The dots and the colors are, are the minimum number of students that we've served in those areas. What do we do? We do lots of assessments, functional vision assessments, learning media assessments, orientation mobility assessments. We do instruction, direct instruction for students more and more. It's getting harder to serve these kids. Why? Because of teacher shortages. And the caseloads are getting very, very large. And, and there, we have to ask ourselves, how big can we allow those caseloads to get before we start to say, is it effective? If you are a provider, an itinerant teacher serving 55 students, it's going to be very, very difficult to provide Braille instruction as an example in a way that will allow those students to move forward. Uh, we do mentoring and coaching classes, workshops, and demonstrations. Again, early childhood is where we have to go and focus. We have our own preschool. It's grown to seven kids. We offer it every day of the week now. We know that will grow. Um, and we know that there are students in Part C, birth to three, that, that are out there that are not being identified, not being referred. But the good news is they're coming to us now and asking us more and more. Almost every day, we get a service request from an infant toddler network saying, come, come help us do an observation for us. I need you to look at this student. We have concerns. That's great news. But, but my sense is if we offered more services or had more staff, that would continue to go through the roof because that's where the students are and that's where we need to connect with the parents. So I've asked for a budget enhancement uh, uh, of 10 teachers, 10 teachers I'd like to, and I believe we could um, either recruit or train those teachers to, to come on board for us and to provide services targeted at birth to three, but also all the way up to 21. 
Our online courses are, have continued to grow. We offer computer science, I mentioned that. We do podcasting, braille music. We do speech and debate. And we also offer braille courses for paraprofessionals and families who want to learn braille along the way. So uh, we know that, that there's more out there. We can always add more. But we're offering that and, and educating parents and, and teachers to say, come, come take these courses. If you can't access braille in Stafford, Kansas, perhaps, or Oromigo, then we can provide that to you remotely. Is it as effective as in person? Maybe not. We'd always prefer to do it in person, but it is a, a qualified teacher teaching Braille uh, to those students. So Braille celebration, uh, January is, is a National Literacy, a Braille Literacy Month, and then we do a Braille challenge in February. It's a celebration of Braille literacy, and, and we invite everybody to that, not just the, the winners from last year. Everybody gets to be a part of that and celebrate no matter where you are on your Braille journey. We think it's important to celebrate and to say keep, keep going. Uh, I did want to mention our 5K again. We've been very blessed to, to have the support of the Casey Blind All-Stars. We had 350 registrants for the, for the walk. This, and families from all over the state, Garden City really came strong for us. And Hutchinson, this family, happened to come up from Hutchinson and be a part of the day because they know how important it is to celebrate uh, uh, students who are blind and low vision and their, their independence. They've helped us raise over 210000 for a, a track, so we're very close to raising money. Totally private funds for the replacement of our rubberized service, actually remilling the asphalt, which is, you, if you've been involved in that, you know it's expensive, and then laying the rubberized surface on top. But we think we can get that done without any state funds. Uh, uh, but our gym is going to be more expensive because it requires mercury mitigation. There's mercury under that old floor that you've seen. So to take that out is very expensive. But we do want to reach out to our community and say, can you help us do that? And we've raised uh, over 150 so far. I, I say so far because we have some more irons in the fire with that. Our, our next step, this will wrap, wrap up my presentation. You know, Again, I mentioned parents, uh, how important that is. We have to get access to parents. And, and IEP teams are where decisions get made about services. And we often, I often say to my staff, um, when parents come in, don't just say that they're, they're a nice student, they're, we really like them, they're meeting their IEP goals, and their grades are good. That's all fantastic, but what are their skills? What are their skills in what we would call expanded core and what you might know as functional skills? And then what are their skills in academics? Because without both of those things and without data, they're not going to be ready. So we have to be prepared for that question, and that's the question I want parents all over the state to ask their IEP team. Show me their skills. What data do you have? And, and I think really the, the, the rhetorical question I have is why would you not want information at your IEP team meeting? Why would you not want that information shared with your team and parents? That's really what we're asking for. Uh, we think we can take a larger role in coordinating services because right now it's, it's probably ineff very inefficient in terms of who gets what service. And as a shrinking teacher population, we've got to really get serious about how are we allocating these scarce resources. We've got a proven model that we think works based on data. We'd like to expand it. That's why I'm asking for more money for, for teachers. And then birth to three focus. We need more staff, better identification, more referral, and then better services with that pop, because that's where it starts, and we know that. Uh, kindergarten readiness, you know about kindergarten. It's the same or even more critical for our kids. Are you ready to learn? Are you given access to learn in those environments? So that's our, our message. I want to thank all of you for listening. Um, we do blind soccer. Uh, we're starting a blind soccer team. This got some attention. We did a little demo um, at our 5K, and this is Jimmy kicking a goal. So I thought it was a nice way to finish. So I'll take questions um, from anybody who has them. Thank you. Ann. Um, thank you, John. It just always amazes me how your vision for kids goes beyond what most people even think is possible. So thank you for that. Uh, the Make 48 competition, is that still open for people to sign up? When will it be? It's going to be December 2nd through 4th, so Friday through Sunday. Okay. Uh, if you have any student who's blind or visually impaired that wants to be a part of that, um, we're going to have students who are actually part of those teams working with business representatives mm -hmm. and each other. And then there'll be some ancillary roles for, for students who want to be involved but don't want to be part of the team competition. So it's still open. And uh, let me know if you have. Yeah, I'd like to send. I do a newsletter to all my superintendents, which is Great. 
big group now, so I'd like to send them yeah, we've had strong, all up here in this part of the state. Yeah, and we've had strong interest from all of, these are not just kids from Kansas City, these are students right. from all over the state, but if you have others, let me know, because we want to celebrate this. It's a big, a big deal. I think it fits right in with your goals, the things that you're promoting, some of the programs I see in public schools. Uh, this is just tailored for our kids. So, so they, this group has never worked with a school for the blind, so we're doing some awareness on etiquette. What does it mean to interact with kids who are blind? How does that work? Um, what are some ways you can make your materials accessible, not only for this day, but for every other competition that you do? So um, the DeBruce Foundation and some other groups are supporting this, so some very large corporations who are behind it. We're excited to do it. Cool. Thank you. Looks like Dina's on twice. Similarly, that I ask Luann, um, we think you're doing a great job with outreach and bringing students to your location to actually be served on site. But how many students do you think maybe exists that? you would project are not being served and um, how can we help with that issue to your first question i often have a slide at the beginning that says 1500 800 and then 50. we know there's at least 1500 students in the state who are blind and low vision significant enough to impact their education how do we know that? Because Not because we count those numbers or have authority to do that, but our Instructional Resource Center asks teachers to report, who are you serving, right? And so that's only uh, kindergarten typically through age 21, and that number is, is over 1,200. So we know with that birth to three excluded that it's, it's going to be in the 1,500 range minimum. 800 are the numbers that, that in one way or another our school reaches through our instructional resource center, through our deafblind project, through our outreach services, through our campus-based services. In one way or another, we believe we, we reach 800 students. And then 50 students, I just checked yesterday, we had 50 students enrolled in our programs, our campus-based programs, which is right where we want to be, really. If we had 150 students for us and for our model, we would say that's probably too high. We'd start to ask some questions, but that has grown, and we continue to get referrals for services for students who are struggling um, for one reason or another. Does that answer? And then what are we doing? What can you do to help us, I think, um, making sure that uh, we have access to parents and to IEPT meetings is really important for us because that's where services are decided and determined. But you can only make good decisions if you know what's available to you. Thank you. Melanie. Thank you, Chairman Porter. Well, Sean, you just took the words right out of my mouth. It's, it's hard to identify. It's hard to get to a place where you're finally having that IEP meeting. Um, so I'll just follow up with my other question, which is we've had multiple conversations at this table about the IEP form and some verbiage that needs to be added there that lets parents know, it's, it, as, a, as a parent of any child with an exceptionality, it can be hard to know what your rights are. So it'd be great if that form had that line on it that we've talked about, which is for both schools, being able, the parent is able to have, I don't know the exact words, can somebody help me out with, uh, Bert's been up here before and we've talked about what the wording for that form needs to be, but. Have you guys gotten that language amended to that form yet? Because uh, not, it's a new not school yet. year. Not yet, as, as Luann alluded to, we've had several meetings with Casey and the department. And, and really what I just want the department and the board to know is that, that our interests are, are information. We're not, we're not here to tell people what to do. We're not here to tell, to criticize people for what they are doing. Our job is to help. But, but information is really critical. If you don't know what programs exist or what your child could be a part of, then you're not going to be able to ask for that service or know more about it. And the team can't make good decisions if they don't know what's out there. 286 districts, I believe, it's hard to keep up on what the School for the Blind is doing. We're, we've been moving fast. And I know the School for the Deaf also has been moving fast. To keep up with what's going on is rather difficult. 
Um, there are a lot of IEP meetings. I don't suspect that all parents would want us to come and share, but when they want that, we want to be we want to be there. We find a way to get there and provide information. That's really important to us. Okay, thank you. So, Commissioner Watson, can I put you on the spot and ask, do you know where this is a it's a two-page form if memory serves and it's just a couple of lines that need to be added. Do you know where we are with that? I think uh, John and Lynn have a better status of that. What I've asked is for that to be put on the form and for the process to work. So they're telling me it's not been done yet. So, Not to my knowledge, but I know our, our conversations continue and we're happy to work with Bert to, and, and Casey because they, they have a large role in this. The Kansas Association of Special Ed Administrators off, you know, have a large role in the process. They want to make sure they understand what our role would be and we want to clarify that to say we're there to share information. That's our role. And if we want parents to have access to that information just as the team does, that's, that's really important. During the break, uh, Mr. McNeese and I were having a discussion about the fact that the quality of the presentations that we get now are significantly superior to the quality of the presentations because we've had some pretty blunt discussions about that <laughs> that I'll not go into. Uh, and I just wanted to express appreciation for the fact that we are now, I believe, getting accurate information. And if and and everything's not rosy, uh, and there you identify areas where we need. If we can, ha if we need to help, we need to know what they are. And I just wanted to express appreciation to both of you. For, uh, for presenting uh, accurate information that, that we can use and, and helping you move forward to meet the needs of each of your students. You mentioned 50 on-campus students. Are they all residential? No, no. Uh, about half of those students, I'd say 27 or 28, currently reside in our dormitory. The other, the other half are day students, so those kids are local typically and are, are bused. And often most, a lot of those students are taking courses in their public school. So they'll come to us maybe for part of the day or take a few classes with their public school. Uh, some are full-time students who are just being bused back and forth and, and aren't in the dormitory. But, you know, the, the dorm is, is traditionally for kids who are too far away to be bused back and forth every day or for kids who are in our transition program in particular who need to be moving toward independence and learning independent living skills. So that's those are the two purposes of the dorm um, for our kids. Um, and what's your dorm capacity? I think we could accommodate up to 70, approximately 70 students if, if we were absolutely full and we had two, maybe three students per room. I think you've seen our, our dormitory rooms. They have up to three beds in them and sh dressers and a microwave and, and, and a ref refrigerator with shared bathrooms. It'd be tight, but we could, we could do, I think, up to 70 at any one time. And do you have students on waiting list? N no students on waiting list. Um, at present, uh, although I will say that we've had, you know, challenges in keeping staffing at a place where we feel comfortable. We're always on edge and looking for more, particularly in those overnight, what I call the graveyard shift, 11P to 7A can be tough to find people. Or even in the evening shift, people like to work daytime or they like to work part time. It's been getting harder to find, but so far we've been able to maintain and hold well, thank you. I don't see any other questions. I really appreciate the presentation, and thank you for the great jobs that you're doing. Appreciate it. Thank you. And now I recognize uh, Bill Fafflick, who is going to present the uh, annual report from Acacia. Welcome, Bill, and your staff. Thank you. Chairman Porter. Commissioner Watson and members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to join you today. Look forward to coming before you and sharing some updates from the High School Activities Association. I hope they live up to the excellent presentations that we just have heard. So well, uh, at least they uh, didn't bring bodyguards with them. <laughs> yeah, understood. Yeah, I've got I've got my crew here, and I want to introduce them to you. But I've got a PowerPoint somewhere here that will get pulled up. There we go. All right. And we'll start that up. All right, here we go. So I really appreciate the opportunity to come before you and uh, look forward to sharing with you some of the updates. And you've been involved with our work, and we tr 
appreciate your support uh, of the students in Kansas schools and the students that are involved in our activity program. We have great kids uh, that we know uh, are better because they have the opportunities to participate. We are education-based activities. We're about providing learning opportunities for kids through uh, their participation in performing arts, in athletics, and other school activities. And uh, for those to happen, we know that those events have to be staffed by the proper people. They have to be safe, supported, uh, and uh, provide that incentive for kids to be engaged. Truly transformational experiences exist for the kids that we have. Uh, our year of ahead of us is always about opportunity. It's always about being focused on student health. Today is the National Federation High School Activities Association week of student activities, and today's date is student health. So we're here, last year I think we were here on officials day, and I invited some of you to stripe up with us, and uh, I don't have any takers, but maybe at some point we'll get some more adjudicators. I know Mr. Jones is an adjudicator, and we appreciate his, his work as many of you have done that in the, in the past. We encourage you not to do that from the bleachers. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we are about uh, the different things that are important uh, for the association based upon our desires of our member school. Certainly sportsmanship is a key uh, piece for what we're working on this year, diversity, equity, and inclusion through our activity program. And using that platform is so significant, and we'll share with you some of the learnings that we're going through in that regard. Uh, we are at a crisis point, and officials uh, across the state of Kansas are dwindling in numbers. We're not replacing them as quickly as uh, they are retiring. Uh, and leaving the leaving the vocation so we've had to be creative with scheduling at our member school level uh, we have a focus always on coaches and the work that they do uh, and we're always about telling the story of uh, what we're doing and to do that I'm going to start with three numbers uh, and I'm not going to ask you to find the mean median mode to do any kind of mathematical calculations there some of you get nervous with that but for 1,461 not the number of calls you received on the last issue from the High School Activities Association, uh, no, but it is. Wouldn't, that wouldn't even come close. <laughs> that not even come close. Well, we're getting to that one at the bottom, right? Uh, 1,461. Dina would know as a member of our executive board, number of plaques and trophies that were awarded to our member schools last year. Number of student athletes as we count one by one because we know that while we serve that last number, 214,000 kids, it's always about those students one at a time won 19,169 medals last year awarded by your Kansas State High School Activities Association. And that's because they put in that time, they put in that work, and they achieved at the highest level. But make no mistake, whether you're a medalist, a trophy winner or not, you're better through your participation in activities. And we do that with the staff where I brought with me our Wiley veteran, uh, our, our senior staff member, Francine Martin, who is in her final uh, rendition of working at the High School Activities Association. I want her to come and uh, spend a minute with you and uh, let her say a few words. And then our newest member, uh, our rookie, Kyle Doporowski. Kyle is joining us from uh, the University of North Dakota, and we're, he hit the ground running, and he is engaged in uh, the hard work of getting ready for his first championships in cross country at the end of our fall season, and then the, the beast of basketball follows, and track and field uh, uh, will certainly be no challenge for him. Mark continues to do his fine work with football and wrestling, uh, and is transitioning from track and field to work work with coaching services and to lead our Kansas coaching school, our coaching education program and certification uh, for folks to work with, with our student athletes. Craig is coming off his final year as the chairman of the National Federation of High School Music uh, Educators. And what a great job he has done. In the most difficult of times, Craig provided solid leadership, not just in music, but in all of our performing arts. And uh, we're so pleased to have him. Jeremy introduced a new program I shared with you last year. I'll give you an update on, uh, which is Keisha Cover. And Keisha Covered helps us tell the story of the great kids, coaches, and, and school communities that we serve. Uh, he also administers baseball, softball, golf, uh, and does a lot of great things in our office in terms of communication. Rod continues with soccer, swimming, and diving, hosted our first ever National Student Council Conference at Mission Valley or at uh, Spring Hill this summer, uh, and had uh, kids from many, many states, 34 states across the country came and participated in that student council workshop for a week. Uh, we're so glad that they were here. Uh, Annie Diedrich uh, was the newbie until Kyle arrived, and she is uh, getting ready for uh, a busy, busy fall championship season. This is the second week of eight consecutive weeks of championship events, and Annie has a large number of those right at the beginning with uh, tennis uh, championships this weekend, followed soon by gymnastics and then volleyball. We also obviously have cross-country 
country in football. Nine football championships this year uh, with the addition of six-player football. Uh, Brent Unruh, uh, this is his day. It is Health and Safety Day, and Brent is our Director of Operations, but he also coordinates our Sports Medicine Advisory Committee, and we'll talk about some of the mental health updates that we've done this year. But uh, with that, I'm going to defer to Fran and ask her to uh, say a few words, and then followed by Kyle, and then you're going to be stuck with me for the remainder of the presentation. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Faflick. And again, I, I, I am, I'm here, um, as Mr. Faflick indicated, I'm finishing my career 38 years in education. Um, I started out as a teacher and a coach and moved through the administrative ranks as a pr assistant principal and activities athletic director. And, the, the, you know, I, I will say that the most rewarding part for me is just to be able to see kids have success. And success comes in many different forms. And the majority of the time, it's not in championships. It's in those little successes that they have as they go along in their challenge of getting better, not only as a player, but also as a person. And I want to thank you guys as a board of being leaders, um, not only in the state, but nationally, to provide our kids the best opportunities that they can have. And as a teacher, as an administrator, I've had that opportunity for 38 years. I look forward to maybe a little bit slower days um, and a few less emails um, and a few less phone calls, but I've had a great team to work with at the Activities Association, uh, just like I did coming up through my career at La Crosse and El Dorado and Topeka Seaman as a teacher and a coach. And so appreciate all that you guys do. Um, continue to do good work. I know it's a hard job, um, but anytime you're in a leadership position, there are difficult decisions that have to be made. Keep fighting the good fight. Hello everyone, I'm Kyle Doperalski. As Bill said, I'm in day about 100 with the Kansas State High School Activities Association and excited to be here. I was born in Manhattan and raised in Wamego where I attended K through 12 schools and then Cloud County Community College in Concordia. So the first 20 years of my life were all in Kansas and the next 20 were all out of Kansas participating and working in college athletics in Nebraska and New Mexico and as Bill mentioned, the last 10 years as a senior staff member at the University of North Dakota in the athletic department. As you guys know, kids get educated in the classroom and also outside the classroom and I am uh, excited excited to be here to work with our staff and you to talk about uh, and work with the education outside of the classroom. So thank you guys, as Fran and Bill said, for everything that you do for kids in our state. And I'm a firm believer in education-based activities for Kansans. So thank you guys very much. And welcome back to Kansas. We're thrilled to have Kyle. We're so grateful for Fran and her service. We'll continue to celebrate as the year goes on, but uh, please mark the middle of June for a, a special celebration for Fran as, as she does retire and spends time uh, on the farm and uh, continues to coach because I think that's ingrained in, in certain individuals. And Fran has always been a coach and uh, we're better because of her work. So as we think about this year, certainly we we talk about a little bit about a review and uh, we'll go through each of these different activity or different uh, items as we go forward. But we're going to start by selling Celebrating. We had a, a tremendous honor with uh, a first ever NFHS Heart of the Arts Award winner from Kansas, from St. Mary's Colgan, uh, Lola Wade, uh, was that recipient and honored this summer at our national uh, conference. And we're so proud of the work that our educators do and the recognition that they often do not get. This was an opportunity for Lola to represent Kansas, performing arts uh, at that highest level. We also provided, uh, provide as the only state in the country, a, national, uh, a state performing arts school of excellence award. Uh, this past uh, month, we were out in the great high school community of McPherson, Kansas. And uh, while we were there, we recognized McPherson as our state winner of the uh, Performing Arts School of Excellence. That particular award is only in its sixth year of existence. And our first winner was Washburn Rural. They were the NFHS national winner that year. And from that, we stemmed into this having an annual award. It is selected by a group of administrators that come together in the summer based upon a body of work, including the data uh, that we're able to glean from the different activities. So we're so proud of McPherson and the, uh, the great work that the teachers and educators are doing in that community. We also celebrated uh, an important date of June 23rd. June 23rd uh, was the 50th anniversary of Title IX. Uh, passage of uh, Title IX signed by President Nixon at that time provided opportunities for uh, girls in high school sports and, and women in at all levels uh, to be supported and to give those opportunities the same as uh, the opposite gender had to help celebrate. We told the story through weekly releases of uh, a featured Kansan that made a difference in Title IX uh, work and was 
a trailblazer or an icon in that sport. And then we also, at each one of our, fem each one of our girls' championships, highlighted uh, an individual or a group of individuals through this. Uh, this is particularly a, a ball that was signed by Lynette Woodard, one of the most famous uh, women basketball players of all times, a graduate of Wichita North High School, and she brought out to the state championship the game ball, uh, handed awards out to the athletes after they won their state championship at the Class 6A tournament. We had presentations at all seven of our sites for basketball. They were very well received and we're uh, very excited. We also did first shots in, first tee shots in, in golf and first pitches in softball and uh, returning uh, medalists and, and swimming and uh, across the board. It was fun. And June 23rd was also a day that we have to remember that we're about the kids of today in our school, but the kids of, uh, of the future. On June 23rd, uh, we met the valedictorian in the class of 2041, which happens to be my first granddaughter, uh, and just had to share that. But we do this for those kids because they are about uh, our future and the opportunities that we have to make a difference for kids. And when you wear a lot of hats, you never can forget the most important hat that you wear is that of a parent, uh, a sibling, uh, an aunt or an uncle of kids that are in our school and the importance of education now. We're about inclusion, and uh, we ramped up our uh, wheelchair racing at the state track and field meet with four uh, championship races in the 100 meters and 400 meters for boys and girls. And to see the pride on those kids' faces as they came across that line as gold medal champions and being recognized as part of the school team and representing their school and their school community was really, really significant. Significant for them, but significant for their teammates. Uh, we completed our first year of unified bowling and are getting ready for our second championship that will be held right here in Topeka at Gage Bowl. In just a few short weeks, competition is underway. It is a short season, but we're so proud of uh, providing opportunities for the cognitively disabled to be athletes in our program and partner with uh, fully functioning uh, students in, uh, in their class. So Unified Bowling was a big hit. We're looking forward to seeing it continue to grow. One of those other activities that we have had great growth in is, is wrestling. We've added girls wrestling. Uh, it is now in its fifth year, and you can see our numbers continue to grow. We had an all-time high in terms of no, total number of participants and know that it will continue to grow so much so we're reworking the format for our championships so that uh, we can make sure that both boys and girls have that, that feature stage. Another activity we track very closely and is a, certainly a national trend is football participation. A lot of concern relative to the uh, risk minimization with football. National Federation has provided, uh, has provided increasing resources for this, and we do our own work as well with our Sports Medicine Advisory Committee, but we begin to see a turn in the tide in having more students participate. Uh, and we have a seven-year high this year in students participating in football. And as I noted, you know, one of those areas of growth is in our smaller schools where we have eight-player football, two different championships, and our first ever state championship in six-player football will be conducted the Saturday after Thanksgiving out in Dodge City. We have great kids that have championship performances. And, you know, as an example, you know, this past year, uh, we had this young man sets a state record throwing 59-4 in the, in the shot, uh, was also uh, a state record, is also uh, going off to an Ivy League school. And that's the kind of education that our kids get as they have the opportunity to participate. What an incredible year we had last year in terms of championships because we had uh, great performances throughout. But again, it's not always about that. It's always about about telling that story, and Keisha Covered has allowed us to do that by providing the opportunity through Keisha Covered with four staff members through a grant that we have or through a partnership that we have with Capital Federal, we're able to have uh, writers in four different parts of the state telling those stories, featuring kids, featuring teams, not just those champions, but those that are overcoming adversity, those that are better because of participation, and uh, we'll see that continue. We've culminated our first year with Keisha Covered, uh, not just by telling the stories, but also by providing scholarships in each of the 34 activities that we administer. We're a little concerned in our first year, would we have enough uh, folks to uh, apply for those scholarships? And yes, we did. Nearly 600 applications were received. Uh, we read all of those uh, and evaluated those according to the rubric, and we're uh, happy to provide uh, the $2,000 scholarships made payable to the post-secondary institution to the student athletes that you see, student participants that you see uh, noted on the screen. And uh, what a great group of, of students that we have in our school, whether they're scholarship recipients or not, uh, they're better 
better through their participation. Uh, so we're, we also, not just the athletic performances, but also our activity performances were recognized uh, with that scholarship as well. And we know that program will only continue to grow. In terms of telling the story, uh, we know our website had uh, an increased traffic with uh, a lot of page views and a lot of uh, analytic data for us to look at, which is certainly uh, trending the right way and, and allows us to, to put forward uh, the things that our communities need to know. Uh, not just the face, not just the website, but also the uh, social media presence through Facebook and Twitter. Uh, lots of impressions in a one-month window. Uh, we get a lot of traffic, and uh, certainly we know that uh, people are interested in, in activity. So as we transition from last year into next year, we have the same priorities. Uh, we're continuing to work in these same categories. Uh, we know that health and safety will always be at the top, and we'll share with you what we've done. We'll provide that focus on the missional program. We want to maintain that focus and tell the story. We're not the same as club activities. We're not the same as collegiate activities. We're not the same as recreational sports. How are we different? We have kids and expectations that ha they have to meet six eligibility criteria of scholarship, of enrollment, of attendance, of age, of citizenship that allows them to represent their school are still important to our member schools and uh, important part of that eligibility component. You certainly took a, a big step uh, with us by supporting the classification proposal. and We appreciate that. Uh, that we'll go to the next uh, stage in that process as, as we move forward and certainly want those championships to be uh, the very best they can be. Uh, so as, we, as we move forward uh, with mental health, uh, on this day and every day, we are very cognizant of the fact that we have a, a tremendous soapbox, a tremendous platform, but we also introduce a level of anxiety potentially for student athletes, and we want to make sure that they are getting the support that they need. So through Sports Medicine Advisory, we have a mental health toolbox that we've had. We developed that in the last couple of years, uh, the examples of risk and, and equipping coaches to tell the, to ask the questions, to have the conversations so they can connect kids that are in crisis or those that are headed the wrong direction that are struggling with healthcare professionals that will be able to help them overcome whatever that challenge is that they're facing. The other thing that's brand new for us is uh, we launched a, a series of short videos that we recorded with our Sports Medicine Advisory Committee and our student advisory team. These students are featured in uh, a couple of the videos talking about things that are important to them than things that adults need to remember. They're eight to 10 minutes in length uh, because we wanted to not have an hour and a half training seminar, but different vignettes that folks could go to and that they could look and see, you know, what, how am I going to use the coach's role? What's the background on this? What about dealing with anxiety? What about dealing with depression? How, what resources are available? And these videos are really good tools to be used we're using those with our member schools, and we know they've been picked up by a number of other agencies as well, as well as uh, other state associations are, are using the same videos that your Kansas schools uh, have created. Uh, one of the big items that was a change this year was relative to the traditional heat and humidity. In the fall, we know that Kansas is one of those states that has very high heat and uh, a stress on student athletes that may not be acclimated to participating in middle of August when our season begins. Uh, so we introduced uh, a wet bulb globe thermometer as the best practice uh, process to determine uh, the amount of solar radiation uh, that is evident at every practice site throughout the course of the year. Through a foundation grant, we provided these, and through our activity resources, uh, we provided a wet bulb globe thermometer to every Kansas high school, working on equipping the middle schools with this same device. What is solar radiation? It's the amount of heat. Typically, yes, the ambient temperature, but it's also the angle of elevation of the sun, the humidity that's there, uh, cloud cover, the wind. Uh, all of those factors are measured by uh, this wet bulb globe thermometer. And based upon that, uh, we have different zones that our member schools can follow. And it may be different at tennis than it is on the football field. It may be different on the soccer pitch than it is an, on the cross-country uh, practice site. So our, our coaches have the ability to, to monitor that and to implement that so that they can modify practices accordingly at the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the year. Uh, sportsmanship is a focus that we have for this year. Uh, it continues to be an area that we see increased opportunity uh, for us to engage. Uh, we seek input from our student advisory team on a regular basis and sportsmanship summits that we host throughout the uh, season 
agencies that our member schools host throughout the year as well, uh, and through our, our leadership boards. Uh, we know it has a significant impact on France focus for this year, which is working with officials. Her, her job this year is to serve officials and to develop that position so we can have one full-time person dedicated administratively to supporting our work with officials. If we have a crisis and we don't address it with staff, we haven't implemented our resources appropriately. So this is a way for Fran in her final year to build that and then we'll replace that position with a full-time officials coordinator as we move forward. And we know that that person will not just develop the quality of officials but also uh, the depth of the field that we have uh, so that our, our school activities can, can continue, can continue uh, as we want them. Without officials, it's just recess, right? We can't have a game unless we have a, a, a fair and impartial adjudicator in order to have that um, activity go on. So you'll see a lot about us recruiting officials and, and asking folks to be part of that. But we know that the number one deterrent of that to people continuing is uh, responses from fans at contests uh, to the officials on the field potentially players and coaches as well. And we have policies that we have adopted that are uh, certainly designed to help impact a change in behavior. Uh, one of the other areas of focus is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our staff, entire staff, uh, participated in a national book study, uh, eight ways uh, to support uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, what a great study it was. And now uh, we have 54 schools across the state of Kansas involved in a national book study uh, over four successive weeks, and we're excited to see uh, the impact that this can have, not just in participating in the book study, but the learnings that come out of that uh, so that we can address any bias that, that might be prevalent and make sure that our activities are open uh, to all and all are supported that are participating. Uh, we had adopted a brand new policy. Our single biggest issue is transfers. I think you heard that uh, as you dealt with a number of issues relative to our classification system. What about transfers? Well, we have a transfer rule that applies to all all 751 member schools that we have. Uh, not, not a difference if you're public or private, but the perception is out there that there are certain rules for certain schools. Not necessarily true, not true at all. We just have to do a better job of communicating and teaching, and that was the goal of this uh, singular topic agenda uh, for all of the administrators in Kansas to participate in, one administrator from each school, the athletic or activity administrator, uh, and we focused on Rule 18 transfer. Uh, certainly had good impact on that because the numbers of transfer requests and the processing of, uh, of those forms has gone way up this year, uh, and that's a good thing. As noted, uh, you guys did a huge, uh, uh, took a huge step for us to provide uh, our next step to going to the legislators to get relief to uh, state statute. Without that approval, we'll have a classification system that's based upon a descending order list by student enrollment. As we transition, it was important for us to have a protocol in place. If we can get the relief we need, our focus changes to just asking the legislators for that, knowing that we can implement what our member schools have approved and that you have had the opportunity to review. But we can tweak that if we get that relief from our legislators and hope that that will certainly be the case as we move forward. Uh, you know, we, we are big on communication and uh, sometimes it's very difficult uh, when those conversations don't occur. So often we initiate those conversations and whenever we believe there's an issue, our goal is to have that conversation so we can address the issue that's there. We start internally and we go externally to all of our membership and to our school communities uh, because we know it's about teaching. We're all teachers at heart and we know it's about getting better and about uh, learning what the expectations are and then developing plans to implement those uh, and, and then implementation process because uh, Giving these kids opportunities, giving students in our schools opportunities now will make a, a significant difference uh, for them. And we know that a key for any team is starts with that communication uh, in order for kids to have opportunities to participate and to participate in pursuit of, of their goals. And certainly uh, we have had a great year and we look forward to a better year ahead and we appreciate the support that you have. Our buzzword for this year is respect. Uh, and it's respect for all. It's respect for your opponent. It's respect for the officials that are working contests, whether it be uh, an adjudicator at a performing arts event or whether it be an official uh, that's in a striped shirt or a blue volleyball shirt. We need to make sure that we're providing that respect, respect for the rules of the game. Uh, that old respect for authority seems to have lost a little bit of its luster, but it's important that that's a lesson that we teach through our activities association, uh, through the participation that students have. And uh, we don't do this 
singular. I have a great staff of uh, 19 folks in our office and the four beat writers that we have that are out and about. We do this with your support. We do this with the support of administrators across the state of Kansas uh, that are in our member schools that work so hard to provide inclusive, safe, uh, education-based activities for all. So thank you for what you do. Uh, thank you for your leadership and for your support. Uh, and I'm certainly prepared for any questions. I hope I'm prepared for any questions that you might have. If I don't have the answer, I, I know I'll be able to find it for you. Well, thank you. Uh, there are several questions, but first of all, we've already had this conversation. Uh, you know, we had a, a discussion yesterday about uh, mascots. Uh, with uh, with a group of people representing the indigenous population, and one of my colleagues asked if there was a list of uh, just a general list of all mascots, and I think you indicated there was. Can you make sure that Barbara has that so she can share it with the rest of us? Yes, sir. We'll get that list to you. High schools and middle school mascots. We'll get that to, to Barbara for distribution. Okay. Thank you very much, Ann. Thank you, and thank you for all this. You guys have so much to say grace over. I don't know how you do it, but I, ha I have two questions. You mentioned, uh, listed up there, the transgender issue, which I know will come up again that next legislative session. And I think the board's kind of taken a, if not formal, informal position that whatever happens with transgender activity, kids in those activities, it should be the purview of the associations that run them, either Keisha or NCAA or, or whatever. But I've, there's been some discussion that the Keisha rule on how you determine what sex you are for activities is not as tight as it could be. Do you know if your board intends to address the Keisha policy on that at all? We have not had, we've had discussions internally about our transgender policy, which has been in existence about eight years now, and it has worked fairly effectively. Uh, very few students identify, I think there may be more that are not going through the process that we might not know about, but many of those students may not be participating. So uh, our policy has worked fairly well. Uh, it has been member generated, member approved, and we'll continue to review that as we move forward. Uh, it's not currently an agenda item before our executive board, but it certainly can be. Okay, well I know there was always a question in the hearings about how many transgender kids there are in activities. So if that's a number you guys have, that'd be helpful. You bet. And that, that number is, is very small. It's less yeah. than, yeah, we have seven students that have registered with us as mm -hmm. transgender participants, born uh, one gender participating, opposing gender uh, across the state in a seven through 12 uh, scenario. So it's not a large number. And that's one of the reasons maybe the policy is, you know, yeah. seems to be working. Uh, the, the real crux of the decision has to be at the local level because those are students that are known best to the school administrators and the mm -hmm. healthcare providers in their school community. So we empower our member school leadership teams uh, to work with those families to provide support for those students so that all students are supported and all students have opportunities uh, to participate in the appropriate way. Not to gain an advantage, right. uh, but certainly uh, appropriately access to, to those activities. Okay, and if I, one other question. Um, our student voice committee's been out and about in a lot of activities, and we've been to K Camp and Stuco Camp and, and uh, met with your student leadership team. And the one thing that jumped out, I think, to all three of us was that between K and Stuco and your student leadership team, those student bodies did not reflect the demographics of the state. And wondering what we can do to get more students of color involved in your leadership team and in STUCO and other organizations. Great question. And I fully understand that. We want our committees, our boards, uh, to reflect the schools and the communities that we serve. Uh, and at some point, we're at the mercy of our membership in that regard in terms of who they submit and who they send uh, at the local level to those. Uh, we do have some policies in place. And one of the reasons we're working through the diversity, equity, and inclusion component to make sure that we are intentional in that regard. And uh, I think we're, we're making progress, but we're not where we need to be. Okay. Well, maybe you can show more leadership in saying, I know it's up to you guys, but hey, we need to have these organizations reflect the student body better. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Betty. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Um, there are a couple of things. Be, um, 
and this is a perfect venue to kind of take an aside. Typically, when I hear from um, parents or students, it's because there's a concern. So if you could take the opportunity to perhaps um, give some information on how parents and or students can best direct their concerns um, in a way where they feel like, number one, they're taken um, seriously and um, but not pushed aside. From parents, I hear concerns about um, um, behavior of coaches. From students, concerns that I don't know who or how I would approach um, this organization if I have a concern. So if there is a prescribed way um, where these concerns can be best heard by uh, those that are in a position to resolve it, I sure wish you would take an opportunity to share that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Arnold. Yeah, our, our, our typical chain of communication uh, is things are best addressed at the local level, and we encourage student athletes and parents to start with the coach. Uh, to seek resolution to whatever issue that is, so a coach or a sponsor of an activity. It might be a stuco, it might be a cheerleading, it may be a, uh, a football or cross country or whatever happens to be, they start with the coach level. And then the progression goes from there through an activity or an athletic director to a building principal. Uh, and then uh, without resolution, it may go to a superintendent or it may come to our office. Uh, we always are going to be transparent in communications uh, and we get a number of communications that we will review and share with the member school that we need to follow up with the member school and then respond to that family as well. Uh, but we, we like that communication to be at the local level and uh, our training is designed to empower those local leaders to know the rules uh, so that they can apply the rules uh, with that fidelity that we would expect ac across the state. There are different interpretations, make no mistake about that, but uh, the, the rules themselves aren't changing, but the interpretations may, and that's, wh that's where we struggle. So we're trying to take some of that wiggle out, uh, and we have no problem. Our, our phones are busy, our emails are, are, are busy, just like yours are, and uh, our goal is to provide that transparency and, and help at the local level first uh, before it comes to us. Many things are resolved at that local level if conversations start. If you go back to that slide about communication, it's got to have the, got to start the conversation. And if we're the ones that are starting it, that's okay. We can help bring a, hopefully a resolution uh, for the impacted party. Okay. And <clears throat> from the student perspective, this was an issue that came up um, as a part of being on the committee for student voice. And um, uh, there was a concern this summer uh, as it has to do with, um, I think there was an outbreak of, of COVID. Um, and many students were concerned that they had paid the money to participate and there was no um, refund, which was why they stayed. That is kind of uh, above or beyond what would happen from parents being concerned about coaches. How would a student resolve that? I mean, is that a local level or is that a rule that is made by uh, Keisha or? That, that would be our, that would, if, it, if it's one of our events, it would be one of our policies and procedures. They would just need to contact our, our staff and our administrator, we'll walk through that with them. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Dina. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jim, yes. did you? And then I'd like to follow. No, I'm sorry, there was only one thing. There's only one Do I need to put my <laughs> name back up. There. No, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dina. Uh, first of all, Fran, thank you very much for your service, your leadership, and your multiple hours of driving to places. You know, um, it has been a pleasure to work with you over the years. I uh, had that pleasure numerous times, so and it was always good to see you at events and activities. You represent the best of, of the Activities Association leadership, so thank you for your service. You know, uh, Bill, did you breathe at all during your presentation? <laughs> I, don't think so. I get excited, uh, Mr. McNeese, and I just like math class. Yeah. Oh, man, those poor kids. <laughs> um, 
I guess I'd also like to commend uh, you and your team uh, for the leadership that we have in our state that sometimes we don't appreciate near as much. Uh, we're one of the, recognized as one of the uh, most successful states in terms of providing uh, resources, activities, programs, and safety for our students. So I, I'm not sure we always understand and appreciate you because a lot of times it, you guys and your leadership role have to be there to kind of straighten the road or you know keep them on track. And sometimes that can, get, that can be very irritating to people. But that's why we're good. And the number one focus of the organization and under your leadership, Bill, and my time with you in service of other in, in Wichita has always been the safety of the students, you know, and, uh, and the success of students. So thank you very much for what you do. I really appreciate it. And please extend that, that compliment to the uh, staff back at, at KSA. Yes, sir. Thank yeah. you. Mayor Dean. Maybe. Okay. Try to figure out when it's on and when it's not. It's fun. Anyway, I pretty much was going to do somewhat the same, make the same kind of comments that Jim just did. So I could say just ditto. But I want to personally say, as a member of the executive board, and the board of directors that, you know, you really don't know all that's behind the scenes until you sit on the executive board. And I'm sure there's even more that I don't know that goes on behind the scenes from some people that are very, that care deeply about kids and are involved in making decisions on a daily basis. And um, I want to echo what Jim just said, that um, Fran, your leadership is above none and above everyone in that sense. And uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you. And from a women's point of view, it's even more exciting to see women in leadership. And you've proven that we can be great leaders. And I want to welcome Kyle because he has some great uh, knowledge and experience to bring to the state of Kansas that it's going to be exciting to see what kind of decisions and experiences that our students will be able to uh, be provided through Keisha because of your presence. And thank you, Bill, for your great leadership of Keisha. I've been amazed and um, I can thank my colleagues for allowing me the opportunity, but it's been a great opportunity just to meet all of you and get to know you all. Because I can assure you that there isn't a group of people who care more about the success of kids and it's not just in athletics, it's being a successful person. And thank you.
On behalf of my colleagues, I want to thank you for your presentation. Welcome, Kyle, to Kansas, back to Kansas. Fran, we wish you the best in retirement. If you'll look at this board, several of us are retired, and I hope you don't fail retirement <laughs> like we have. Anyway, thank you very much. We appreciate this. I briefly served on the big board uh, earlier on, and uh, and you know it's it, it's a complicated, very complicated with a, with all sorts of balls up in the air, and we re I really appreciate it and admire what you do. Good business. Thank you all very much. You. We are in recess for fifteen minutes, and we will reconvene in room two fifty.
just wanted you to, to meet them. We uh, asked a really weird question at the beginning of the ARC training we had a couple weeks ago. We said, when was the last, what were you doing the last year KU was ranked in the top 20 in football? <laughs> and so everybody had to Google when that was. It was 2008. So Andre, I got to say, well, I was sitting in a classroom in third grade. So, uh, so that that was that was fun. But um, you know, the connection with higher ed, I think, is something we really need to focus on. So it's great to have Catherine on our team. She does, you know, all the work she does, all the program reviews, all the accrediting of the higher ed teacher prep programs. That's a lot of work, and to align our P12 accreditation with higher ed accreditation just makes too much sense not to do. So it's it's great to have Catherine on the team and Jake bringing his perspective. I mean, he's got a lot of experience, a lot of varied experience to bring, bring to the table. So I wanted you to meet. Jeff I Spoke. did forget the most important part about my resume. I'm from Garden City, Kansas. <laughs> and, uh, Buffalo. Uh, graduate. Sorry to interrupt. No. <laughs> I don't care. Weird. <laughs> So uh, Myra and Sarah are going to help me because I need a lot of help with this presentation. And Jake and, and Andre and Catherine, if you need to have other places to be or other work to do, feel free. But I just wanted the, the board to have a chance to meet. So with that, we are going to, I think. <clears throat> yeah, this was working earlier. Okay. Wow. I apologize. This is working. Okay. What yeah, happened there? So you met our team. I should have had this up while they were introducing. That would have been better. Um, this is our mission. So when we came together in the spring, we felt like it was really strong. I know there was talk about the mission yesterday in the board. It's really important to have a mission statement. This is why we get up in the morning, and this is what we're doing. Our focus is on accountability and support. And those are not always in different contexts, but in this context, they are. Accountability is, for example, talking to the system about their results, talking to the system about the steps of their process. Support, and, and we started some of this, and we'll share some of that data with you that we started with our summer check ins. Support really manifests itself as us connecting systems to other support providers. And I, I think we're coordinated at this moment, but I, I think it's it's glaringly obvious to see that there are times when systems need some support and it's just not happening happening in a timely manner. So we can be that connection piece between the service center, between the uh, TAS and network. So that's really where the support comes is us as, as connectors. And then the accountability is having those yearly check-ins with systems talking through their results and their process. Um, so today we wanted to have, some, <clears throat> excuse me, we have some time for you to discuss some questions. We have some focus group questions we ask educators in the spring. We'd like to also ask the board those and, and compare the responses. So we'll have some time for that. Um, we also want to share with you what educators did share with us in those focus groups and in some other, other meetings that we were having in the spring. We want to go through and clearly state where, what's the current state of ESA in terms of both process and results and evidence of both those. And then finish with the future state of TISA. And that really is our response to what educators shared uh, from this spring. Just like the board developed a vision based on what Kansan said, we wanted to follow the same process as we build out and seek to improve PISA uh, based on the responses that we got. The other thing I want to make sure we're clear on is that PISA, the acronym, is not going anywhere. It's still going to be PISA, the acronym. The process is what we're improving and changing. And I think that's what the board would expect. The board expects continued improvement from systems should expect from us continuous improvement of the KISA process. So really, I don't know, this was, uh, I just found this, this is probably something that a second grader did, but KISA is really the lever for the vision. And in our view, it's the strategy. You talk about schools that have strategies, they have project-based learning, or they have 
some sort of classroom strategy they employ, right, to help kids be more successful. We feel like at the state level, our main strategy is KISA. And it serves to be the lever to move the vision in the positive direction. So that's how we view KISA in this context. I'm so glad Randy shared this yesterday. Um, and I know Jean had asked earlier in an early board meeting, what's the connection between redesign and KISA? It's here. The CANS and SCAN school design principles, which have been in place for four years, four or five years now, uh, again, we're a conglomeration of what Kansas said they wanted to see in the school. So this comes from what Kansas said they wanted to see. And as you look at those, um, as we talk in terms of piece of, of continuous improvement, really the design principles are just like what Kisa is to the vision. The design principles are, they're the connection to Kisa via strategy. So we've always said this, and uh, I've I've heard several people in this room say this. <clears throat> if KISA never has an impact on the classroom, then it's just four letters on a page. And so through these design principles, that's where the impact can be seen that KISA has in the classroom. Who develops strategies? Teachers develop strategies. They develop strategies that leverage the goals the system is set that are aligned with the vision. So in, the, in terms of KISA, the connection between redesign, now design, those design principles are via strategies for the classroom. So uh, I, I just love this quote. I know Randy shares it quite often. Um, and just want to share a little bit of a story about this. My dad, um, we grew up on a farm in Southwest Kansas. Um, our Address was Garfield, Kansas. Um, and my dad was an educator, got out of education, and wanted to start farming. <clears throat> and just start from scratch farming. And this is in the 80s, okay? This is in the 80s. So he left the classroom, he left the building, and started this farm. And my dad, if he's anything, he is a meticulous planner. I mean, to the day, to this day, he still pulls out his Franklin Day planner, right? Forget that phone. I'm going to go to my day planner. He's a meticulous planner. So he put together a really strong plan for how we were going to grow this small farm that we started. I was part of the plan, unfortunately, at times. My brother, my mom, we were all part of that plan. And dad would say if the plan failed, whose fault is it, right? It's, it's his help's fault. So um, I, that was his plan. But if you can think back to that time, the economy, the, the commodity, commodity prices were very low, land was really high, interest rates were off the charts. You saw those farm closures going on there in the 80s. So it was a really difficult time to start farming. And so um, I think at that point, it switched from having a plan to doing a lot of planning. And that's the piece that I always tell my dad, because this, this did not end well on the farm, but overall, he's had a successful career. He went back in education. He was actually a middle school principal of the year one year in Kansas. But if he wouldn't have done a lot of planning during that time, he never would have developed the skills he needed to be successful in that next job. Planning is critical. Having plans, they're going to be flexible. They're going to change. The same holds true with KISA. We've had a plan in place for KISA. It needs to adapt, it needs to change, and we're doing a lot of planning. So today, what you're gonna hear from us are a lot of the things that we've talked about as we plan moving forward. We really need to continue to, to, to take that on as we move forward. Um, so we're gonna start a discussion, and I just wanted to take a, a second to talk through two frames of reference for leaders. Sometimes we take a reflexive lens to the conversation. Sometimes we take a reflective. Today, we'd like to stay on the reflective side. At times when you get into reflexive, it's like, what's wrong with this? What do we need to fix? And I'm sure you've had those, those my, maybe those questions rolling around in your mind around PISA. What's wrong with PISA? What do we need to fix with PISA? That's not what today is about. Today is, we need to make some sense. 
out of where we are currently with ESA and where we want to go, and hear from you your thoughts on that. We want to communicate to learn. We want to give good data, like the data you saw yesterday from Dr. Watson. That's really strong data. We want to listen for understanding, and we want to make sense. So as you approach this next period where we'll have some discussion time for you all, let's try to stay in that frame of reflective thinking um, and not revert back sometimes to, uh, to reflexive thinking, okay? So these questions we have, we ask these three questions of several groups in the spring around KISA. And the first question we want to, and it's very similar to the questions we asked, we want to ask the board and to have you discuss in groups. So I know it's the room's not great, but if a couple groups of three and a group of four, that would be great. Um, have, give you some, give you 10 minutes to discuss this question. What have you heard from systems in your region regarding how the process, the piece of process has led to improvement for their students? So discuss that for 10 minutes. Then we'll come back. When we come back, we want to hear what you heard, not necessarily what you said during that time that you're discussing. We want to hit the high points that you talked about, but again, what you heard, not necessarily what you said. Okay. So we'll, we'll with some uh, reflective thinking, take this on. Uh, we'll take 10 minutes and then we'll come back together and debrief. Okay. So is this. How you guys want to group up? Three and three. Those four. Okay. Excellent. You three. That's why I thought the three of us would be able to look at you. That's why I need to look at you. You're out. You can decide. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a name. Oh, um, I'm going to go to the primary years or wherever. I'm not sure what that is. You probably can't do a whole school, but if you could do it. This teacher, like, we're such a Yeah. 
Let's uh let's bring it back to the front. <laughs> well, there wasn't. We we were we were kind of concerned that it would be quiet the whole time. You didn't get anything to worry about. Nothing to worry about. So, what did you hear? What are the main kind of the main points you heard in relation to this? Uh, the systems in your region talking about how cases contributed to their improvement. Not much. Little. Very little. So, what do they do? They expand on that answer, or is it? Uh, they didn't. I expand a lot. Yeah. You, the instructions were to show what other people said. Yeah, really yeah. Good. Gotcha. I'm following so, instructions because I'm a good. <laughs> Jim, can you <laughs> <laughs> not ever. Straight to the I haven't heard a lot. Uh, people appear to be. They, they appear to like the fact. And those of us that came out of No Child Left Behind, or even just looked at us and protested, they like the fact that we are now looking at at kids after we're so that we have we take some responsibility for what happens to kids, and they like the fact that we're tracking kids to the point where we can see whether or not we're the ones that are. I haven't heard a lot, but I track my districts, and I'm seeing. Uh, I've seen significant improvement. The example I gave under No Child Left Behind, my school district where I was, uh, the first year in, in math at high school, you only had to score 29.2 to keep them being on their list. This was you know, at the very beginning. We were 29.3, so we just barely made it. At the end, we were 95%. But our kids were not doing any better post-secondary than they were before. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now, <coughs> we're seeing that what we're doing now has an impact for the success. We were we were teaching the test. We were helping kids prepare to take the test. Uh, and we were successful at that, but we were not seeing long-term success. And now, that's the, 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 <coughs> what we're doing is, is look, it's, it's, we're taking responsibility what happens next? Are they prepared when they walk out of our building? And we want that answer to be yes, and we'll the responsibility. So we could stay on that line of thinking a little bit. And you said not much. You're not hearing much, but I'm assuming that's a good thing. Are they attributing the KISA process to improvement in their students? They're not saying anything. No, really, the only comment I have, the only comment I have, if I mention the name, is a person that's making it back. He's always bragging. He doesn't like these things. He's retired. <laughs> well, frankly, okay. a lot of people I talk to, the parents particularly, they don't even know what accreditation is. Yeah. I mean, honestly, they, they got too much to do. You know, they just want to make sure their kids are learning. That's all they want to know, you know? And so, as far as Keese is concerned, they would, they would have no clue what I was even talking about if I said Keese. <laughs> you know? And if I said accreditation, that might sound like something good to have. Yeah. <laughs> if you said uh, a, a continuous improvement process, do you think parents would? Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So, but uh, <laughs> I, when, I mean, I, I don't know who you're talking about. If you're talking about teachers, administrators, or the community, you know, yeah. but it, it depends on what community you're in. I would assume, you know, because we were talking here because in her community, everybody, every parent knows exactly what's going on there. I promise you, in mine, they don't. Okay. Good point about connections. Well, I don't think they <coughs> make connections okay. with Tisa. They're looking at what they do in the classroom and see success from yeah. that. They they're not thinking that of that as part of Tisa, mm -hmm. even though it feeds into it. We know it does. Well, we've been told that it does, but I think even the teachers, unless they're on a school improvement team or something, 
may not even be aware of the total piece of process. And I think that's a, a major messaging point that we need to recapture. We're talking about recapturing messages. Hopefully the parents are involved in the discussion about their individual plan of study. Yeah. They don't know that's KISA. Yeah. They know that's different. Mm -hmm. yeah. about food? Oh, go ahead, Jim. Uh, what I was going to say, since Jim won't speak for me, is, <laughs> is, 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 is point I said, and I'm in a school constantly. The conversation is the parts of pizza. Every day we talk about portions of pizza every day, whether it's SEL, whether it's kindergarten readiness, because I work in a building with a kindergarten preschool, or at the high school we talk about IPS and post secondary success. We talk about all the components of pizza without ever mentioning pizza. So everybody knows the content of pizza, they just they don't know the umbrella. I don't know if that's necessarily bad. I'll shut up now. No. <laughs> For 30 seconds. Is that a promise? <laughs> it's a politician's promise. <laughs> the board. <laughs> about from in your group. <clears throat> well, I, I think, um, like Jim said, there are a bunch of them who would like to go back to the group. Call me once a year and I'll see how we forget it because the five year process we had under PTA is so long ago, most of us don't remember that we ever had a five year process before, or they haven't been in business, so they don't really understand process improvement and how that really can make a better result. And so, what you get are complaints about all the paperwork and how it changes every year with happens because you know it's been evolving and we're trying to make it better. But I think as we've talked about, you know, we can reduce some of that paperwork, but somehow they have to make the connection between process improvement and better results for kids. Mm -hmm. And some of them have gotten there, they get it, and some of them are still stuck in it. Well, good discussion. I know that we talk often, when, and we'll, we'll share what we heard from educators. That's what you really want to hear from. So. But let's move on to the next question. And I think so, my was yeah. Take you um, so yeah, interesting, interesting conversation because I, I agree. You know, sometimes no news is good news when you don't hear. You know, we're all kind of in that role, leadership role, where if you don't hear anything, you're like, okay, things are probably going pretty well. When you do hear things, it's when things aren't going well. So we're going to kind of follow this up with this, uh, with this next question. What have you heard from systems in your region regarding frustration about? The KISA process. So we talked about the improvement side. What frustration do you hear from systems in your region around this process of KISA? We'll give you about 10, about 10 minutes of that conversation. Well, that's not yeah. Educators? <laughs> I was trying to kind of put people together. I just see all the same things that I see um, regarding frustration. Everything She should have been a supervisor. Uh, 
And yeah, she was always doing that. She so there was a frustration. She, had, uh, she was not going to teach her. Oh, she had no idea what to do. I don't know. She was a lot of trouble. She was a lot of trouble. I think that's probably one of my I was thinking about it. So that's oh, what I'm thinking. I'm very loud. All of a sudden, funny kids. I hear complaints and objects. I think they may have come your area. We need to concentrate on kids. All this good crap. Well, kids don't need social and We don't need this. I'm not hearing that, but I hear that. Observation. We've put, we've put these two up in my first observation. I heard about two or three people say, "What's the difference? It's the same thing." So here we're looking, you know, talking about improvements made to pizza. Here we're talking about frustration. Keeping in mind, we're asking you all the same three questions that we ask of superintendents, the building principals, the curriculum leaders. They look at these two questions in very different ways because those are the people you know. We often say, "You know, the boots on the ground who are dealing with." This on a real day to day basis of looking what improvements are we making for cure Kisa and the frustrations we're hearing about that. So we'll talk more about what we're hearing from them in a little bit. But uh, from you guys, um, a lot of discussion around that. So what are you hearing from systems about their frustrations around the process of Kisa? We'll call them men. Yeah, men. <laughs> men. Well, 
So some of the things that I've, I've heard and not recently since we've had an internal uh, reorganization, but a lot of the frustration I kept hearing was guidance kept changing. Like, oh, this form isn't right. Or so we'd work on this data point and then when they had a flare up, it was like, wait, we don't wanna look at that, we wanna look at this. Well, I didn't prepare that. So I have to go find it. And so the inconsistent guidance from the department was very frustrating for students. Now, since the internal reorganization, I have not heard that at all. And so I think there, the biggest frustration was inconsistent messaging and guidance uh, that we had. Um, and that's, but nobody has been arguing over the tenancy piece in terms of, hey, we actually see this improving our students and the reasons behind it, yeah, it's a lot of work, but educating kids is a lot of work. Um, and so in terms of that, that hasn't been a frustration. It's just, hey, this is good for kids, but the inconsistent guidance and it just seems like the rules keep changing mm -hmm. uh, every other month. And and then superintendents from the east part of the state getting something different from the west part of the state. And that was also frustrating. And I was caught in the middle between some of my superintendents that I could read much music for as the act that was playing there were getting different messages. The different portions were getting different messages. Yeah, good observation. Yes. When you have And when we look at those obstacles to our people, you are going to find a significant number of those students in an urban setting. And when you have a large number of schools and you have some that are doing really, really bad, some that are really, really great. The frustration in that you really don't have, <coughs> don't know what to say to parents, I want to say after they upset where they are. If you're looking at, okay, we're going to go by a certain number. And did they show improvement? Uh, and what you what your scale is for improvement might not necessarily be a reflected scale of improvement that some of the individual buildings are using. So there are greater challenges that um, urban districts face. It's a greater number. And when you try a one size fit all, then you've created a lot of frustration for your larger district. So, yeah, I hear more. When you said one size fits all, that was a great running through my head. Yeah. One size fits all. And we do hear that uh, quite a bit. We hear, and interestingly enough, we hear from both ends of that spectrum. I graduated seven kids this year. One kid doesn't graduate. That's a big percentage difference. So like we hear from both ends, but I think your point is well taken. Kind of how do we account for that large discrepancy in not just size, but needs of those of those systems. Other things that you heard from your systems about frustration. Yeah, yeah. That it's too subjective. Like we say there need to be improvement results, but what does that mean? And you let this school get away with, uh, like, I had more improvement than them, but I got additional credit. You know, under yep. North Central, we were talking about we had hard numbers. You know, we gave them the numbers, like, you only got a three in, in, in you know, whatever, and you needed a four to get accredited. But here, it's like, we'll know it when we see it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I would put you guys all in the get to group because you're hitting all these topics that we're going to be addressing and discussing as we move forward. So Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks. So there's one final question that we have um, that we ask our five different focus groups that we want to pose to you. Um, and one of the things that we really want to focus on today was how are we going to continue to engage stakeholders in building out the next, the next step? And so we've engaged stakeholders through our focus group. 
and we want to make sure that we're engaging you and crafting what happens next by asking if you were setting up the ideal accreditation model, what would it look like? So we really want to make sure that what we're building meets the needs of the stakeholders that uh, benefit from that system, that engage in the work of that system, uh, that feel responsible uh, for, for supporting the work uh, that happens within that model and in that system. So we want to give you about 10 minutes to think about this question and dream around this question. What does the ideal accreditation model look like? Um, so we'll give you about 10 minutes and then we'll ask you again to share out what you've heard from your colleagues. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I
uh, and her parents, uh, I can tell you from more, I can it out, you know, from her.
what I'm hearing is that connection between accreditation and design. How do we get this down to the classroom level? But then how do we support that execution process? Through the That's what design and does. The design principles when we first yeah. started it was, you know, yeah. they owned it. They weren't buying it. They were the faculty boys. Or they were, you know, that, was, that was the basis of it. It just percolated up from them. They like each other. The kids start liking each other. <laughs> <laughs> I like and I want to just push a little bit on the individualized because that seems to be a pretty strong theme for the board. Individualized in the fact that um, who is determining what areas we are improving in? Um, if we have these things, these four things we're going to measure, and this is how we're going to measure it, and let's see if if you have it lived up to it. That instead of that approach, understanding here is a high poverty, chronic absenteeism, you name whatever subgroup that proposes a challenge, population. The probability that we can set So let's engage this building, this leadership, and individualize what we're going to be doing on these. If it's improving relationships, which really is, um, I mean, that's something that's really great because how we interact with each other. We see each other is so significant when we start looking at success, that interpersonal skill. Maybe that's high on, maybe that's what they have determined in order to bring this culture in line or to get you to a place where you welcome the idea of learning. Maybe instead of starting at uh, one, we got to start at a negative 10 and get up to one so we can go from there. That, and that fits in with not one size fits all, um, um, not um, standards, but you know we can't get there. You know, it's, it's, it's like if you were to tell me, Betty Arnold will give you a million dollars if you can lose 40 pounds in 15 minutes. And you know, doggone well, it's not going to happen. You know, I mean, what I'm saying is sometimes it has to be reasonable to be something that can be done. Because if you set it so, the bar is so high, and you know, doggone well, uh, that that can't happen, you're not going to get. And that's me going rogue. I didn't. <laughs> Everything they said was wrong. Because <laughs> we had stakeholder involvement, bringing all those people in, holding the schools accountable, focus on every child, uh, data driven, which is how you identify the pain pockets, mm -hmm. uh, that there's a process to make it better, that you have staff buy in, and a culture of learning. Mm -hmm. So it was all there. And then what's the balance of all of those things when making an accreditation determination is kind of what I took from what you shared as well. What's the weight? Well, I'm going to uh, move us forward, but thank you for uh, your discussion around those questions. And I think we're going to share a little bit with you about what we heard from the field. Thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> so first off, I think that was highly reflective uh, learning that, that just took place. So thank you for engaging in that type of conversation. 
and being making sense out of things. Um, let's see how your answers compare to what educators all across the state said. So back in the spring, we got together a couple of groups of superintendents, curriculum leaders, um, accreditation advisory council. We, we asked them these questions. The regional training pilot systems, the 11 systems that were part of the pilot last year, we asked them those same three questions that you all just weighed in on. And so I'm going to focus on the gears part of that summary. <clears throat> I do want to uh, thank Doug Meckel for putting us in contact with the Comprehensive Center because they put this summary together. So we talked about using good data. This is good qualitative data that you have in front of you. And they, the, the Comprehensive Center as a third party came in, helped us shape the questions. They took the qualitative data and really uh, came up with this. So I'm gonna focus just on the, the, uh, the gears. So really the findings came into three areas, purpose, process, and reporting concerns. And if you equate the number of responses related to any of these with the size of the gear, reporting would take the entire page. I'll say that again. If you equate like how many times it was mentioned, right? With the size of the gear, reporting would take up the entire page, okay? So <laughs> the purpose concerns um, really came around what we talked about. Is it accountability? or is it improvement? There was a lot of lack of clarity around that. Is this accountability? You know, it, most states don't, like Randy said yesterday, most states don't, they separate out accreditation and accountability. We're combining those. So being very clear about, is this accountability or improvement? Clarifying the roles and expectations from the teachers to the principals, to the superintendents, to the OVT. The OVT was mentioned quite often as far as clarifying the role of the OVT. The ARC, the state board, right? Us, KSDE, it's, it's really clarifying the roles and the expectations for all of these. Um, local or state priorities, we, we heard a lot. You know, you obviously have your local priorities that are aligned with state priorities, but a lot of times, um, systems would say what are you have a, there's a lot of priorities right there's a lot of priorities and so i think just kind of narrowing down and it and i think that lended to the last one which is unfocused that's one focus with, with purpose with process and, and were they talking about like eight things to look at <clears throat> and have two minutes or four pages to yeah we heard several variations of that okay. you know we heard people that really don't separate the, the outcomes from the high school graduate, the successful qualities, they combine those together. We had one person say, we have 18 different state priorities. So we, we knew at that point we had a problem. So, but it's, it's really clarifying, what are we focusing on? I think that's part of our planning as we go, go forward. Ben mentioned this, the inconsistent supports, the differing messages. And, and I just want to say, you know, he said before was, was monumental in moving this state forward. Once we conditionally accredit a system, you could, the tide is turning, okay? And so I, I think that's a great thing, but there were some growing pains. I know we've heard people say you're building, you're, you're flying the plane, you're building at the same time. Uh, lack of timely communication that kind of relates so this was mainly from a lot of the OVTs that some systems are not using best practices in improvement. So the OVT saying that um, if specifically in this with this feedback, lack of training, transparency, and connection between the OVT and the ARC. Expectations for the OVT, expectations for the ARC, are they the same? Are they different? Um, lack of system and stakeholder engagement. I know that's been mentioned multiple times today. How important it is to engage your stakeholders when you're building out your improvement process. Um, and then it's complicated. There's a lot of moving parts. And then the reporting concerns, again, it was pretty straightforward. It's a burden. We're spending too much time on the reporting when we want to be spending time on actually improving student outcomes. 
And so, you know, we heard things like, are we leading the world in the rigor of reporting? Are we leading the world in the rigor of, of a process? And, and, and so documents are unclear, inconsistent, and timely. That's the key to the app, the system reports, the OBT reports. This is the one that really hit us, was reporting drives accreditation. That first question we asked today when we asked schools, did KISA contribute to improvement in student outcomes? M many said yes. Many said no. And the ones that said no, we said, so what is KISA? It's reporting. They look at KISA as something you do at the end of the year. It's a reporting function. And so I think that's where, that's where you hear this, reporting drives accreditation. But work they do every day in the classroom is PISA. It's continuous improvement. So it's 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 really reducing some of that burden and putting reporting in the proper context. The OBT reports are unnecessary. They're they're the OBT is doing a, a report every year. The system is doing a report every year. There's a lot of redundancy, and then the technology issues with the KISA app. So we're going to talk through how we're responding to these. But I think there's a lot of alignment between what you responded with today and what you see here. Yes. I was looking at the, you know, we've talked about how they have to report the same thing every year and maybe two, three, or four. They don't have to report as much. But I'm looking at year number one. There's a whole bunch of stuff like our foundational structures marked as optional. Why is that? So we'll talk about the what we've done this year, just specifically for this year in response to this feedback. We'll talk about what we went through and did that. I go to the legislature foundational structures and we're not asking about it. Well, now remember, if it's a five-year cycle, they need to account for foundational structures, right? Do they need to account every year for foundational structures? They only have to do it for this year. Well, I think we could talk about that, but um, I, I, I think we could specifically say to the legislature, they are accounting for foundational structures. Um, what else did we learn? Why is this was that across the board? That was every district. Oh, I'm sorry. The every, everyone was. It's every every district came to Kenneth came up with that, correct? These were focus groups, so they were well, voluntary. Oh, okay. So people would say yes. We'd, we'd but they come were in. kind of from all over. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, with a lot of different across the state, a lot of different positions. Okay. So the fly-ins, we are really addressing these reporting concerns now, this year. We already have. And 2324 will really get more to the purpose and the process concerns, uh, but that's why we're in a big planning mode um, this year. So this is what we, that's what we heard. What we learned, um, and this is, sorry, this is blurry. This is the top bullet points on the, the handout that you have. We heard these things, okay? We learned that this is what should be our response. We need to narrow the focus. We need to be clear about the purpose. Um, we need to reduce the burden of reporting, flexibility in timelines, including annual formative check-ins. That was a big piece. Clarifying the roles, we talked about that, and then professional learning uh, for all stakeholders with bright spot examples. So I just highlighted these three as the ones that we are actively working on responding to. Okay. Um, this is... Uh, a bunch of data uh, from our regional training pilot. So the 11 systems that went through the regional training pilot, we, every after every session, we would provide them an evaluated tool. They would evaluate us. At the end of the year, we had them make some suggestions for improvements in that process side. So you can see a lot of different responses. I just want to highlight the ones that align with what we've already talked about. Concerns about reporting requirements, uh, guidance and clarification for on the KISA process, so be more clear. And then input and clarification on setting goals. Uh, this was, we know where we've come from, right? We've gone, come from choosing two R's for goals to now where you're actually identifying a SMART goal and you're putting that in place. We're still responding to that. We're still seeing systems turn in reports from year five that say, we want to improve family engagement as a goal. So. Input and clarification on setting goals. We're doing a lot of that with our training. And then these are our KISA summer check-ins. So we piloted, much like the budget reviews, you know, systems will bring their budgets in 
in the summer to, to be reviewed, we said, what about your piece of documentation? What about your continuous improvement process? Kind of important. So we uh, we asked 50, I think we, were, we asked 50 year five systems to come in and do that. I think we had 21 that took us up on that and 17 of those responded to this survey. Um, and so you can see that and I'm not sure, I'm not great with math, but I don't think this all adds up to 100%. But um, I'm, I'm not sure where we went off track on that one. But you can see that upper 80s, low 90s agreement on these four questions. And I think Sarah and Myron, we've been a part of all of them. Um, and we're, we're continuing to do them. Like we stopped with the pilot at 21, but we've continued to do that. We have one at 2 o'clock today. So um, we feel like we're learning a lot from these and really want to scale this up. So let's talk about the current state of Keys, and I think Sarah's going to take you through that. So we just wanted to share um, just kind of the numbers when thinking about the accreditation cycle, just where we've um, been in terms of accrediting all of our systems uh, and the status that was um, acted upon by the board for those systems knowing that this year we have our biggest group to date. Um, so we've been able to process up until this point 183 systems. 92 occurred uh, starting in April and we've consistently um, been presenting those to you every month and I think we'll have our final one uh, in November and then December for action. Um, so we've had 92 go through this year and then you can see the breakdown of which were uh, how many were accredited, how many were conditionally accredited initially, and when a system is conditionally accredited, they can accept that status or they can appeal that status provided it's additional information to the ARC. And so we know that this is uh, how many were originally conditionally accredited. We know how many appealed, that did not appeal, so accepted, how many appealed, and then how many of those conditionals were upheld. So for this past year, uh, we had um, from that 92, 87 were fully accredited, and when all was said and done, five were conditionally accredited by the State Board of Education. This year, we will have 179 systems going through the process, so we've been actively working with those systems in year five to start that review process earlier. So we started that review process in April, and it's October, and we're wrapping up. So within six months, we did 92, and we have about double uh, to do this next year. So we really want to start that timeline and that work a lot sooner. So just wanted to, to bring these numbers to you to just kind of give a picture of, of where we've been in terms of just the, the active accrediting systems, what the result of that work has been, um, so that we can set the stage for what we need to accomplish this year. I think Jay's going to talk a little bit more about... I just want to go back on this question. Oh, can, I, can I say something? Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to double this number right here this year. So the I haven't heard anything I think will change because these are the people that delayed. I'm not going to. I'm going to wait till the end. Whoops, I did touch it. Sorry. Um, um, I don't. Uh, well, I had to start over because we've had too much turnover. Whatever, right? But if, if it plays out. 19 of the 130 of the 183 were conditionally accredited. We're going to do about 192. You're going to see between 20 and 25 if that number holds, right? Conditionally accredited. And my guess is they're all going to complain. My, that's just a guess. I don't know that, but but that's the ratio that you're going to be looking at if it holds true. It may not, but but I just want to get you prepared for for that as it comes through. Fix the problem so that we become one team instead of 
a bunch of different silos. So I just want to compliment on taking a look at what people are seeing and hearing. How can we improve and make this necessary process more productive and giving us the outcome, which is student success, to make sure that you are providing that environment for student success. And I just want to compliment you on that. Thank you for your job. Well, I do want to make a comment about where we, what we've just been through and where we're going. <clears throat> when we started this, we talked about it in six meetings. There were no school districts, schools that were conditionally or even close to enough. It was just a rite of passage. Do your work. They'll figure out how to get you through it. So, you know, and there was no relationship between accreditation and the accreditation system. You know, we're at least we have, as Randy mentioned today, you know, we could put one up there and all of a sudden, wait a minute, these guys are taking us seriously. This is not a guarantee that you show up and you, you put your numbers together and if they don't make any sense, you're going to get past them. You know, there, there, there's accountability and accountability. Right. So I think that's a real step forward. Now, how significant that is, I don't know. But it's a great first. Not that I wish there was nobody up there, but I'm mm -hmm. pleased to see that we are holding their feet to the fire. And I'm glad you said that you're not pleased to see any up here, right? That's our goal as a team. Our team goal is that every system goes through and is fully accredited. Okay, that's our goal. Um, and right now we're about 9% conditionally accredited. Um, and as Randy said, 179, 179 systems going through this next year. So currently also, so and this is related to what you just saw, these are some... Uh, this is currently where we are. We have a subjective evaluation of evidence of improvement in student performance. The ARC starts with the accountability report, and they look at that. We've talked about that in our last board meeting, I think. Um, talked about the subjective nature of that. Okay? We have subjectivity in how much evidence needs to be provided to justify a process. Right now, we, it's all narrative-based. So. I'm not, I wasn't the eager student like Sarah was. If Sarah was doing the report, she would probably put together a 75 page report, right? I would not do that, okay? I don't know what I would do, but there's a lot of subjectivity. We, we hear that a lot. What do you want? The OBT, they ask their OBT, what do you want? And so what we're getting right now is we're getting upwards of 35 page reports every year for the system, same 35 page report for the for the OBT, right? And again, that, that burdens, so it's it's subjectivity in terms of how much do you need? We'll talk about how we're gonna respond. And then this came up yesterday, so I added it to the slide. Unclear process, once a system is conditionally accredited, what's our process to work through and support that system as they move forward, right? Uh, we're, we're just, Unclear on that right now. Oh, how we have it set is the uh, the arc says this is the area for improvement, and they set a deadline, and then that deadline is there. We share that with the system. But what happens if they don't submit anything by the time the deadline passes? What if they submit something? Does the arc have to review it right then? I mean, we just need to work through those processes. And the bigger picture is what support do they need to respond to that? So I think that's pretty blurry right now. Some of that's really blurry. Um, and I think Myra now is gonna talk about the future state. Yeah. Okay. So every time I hear somebody say 179 systems, I get a little tired. There's gonna be a lot of work to go through this year. <laughs> but, uh, but we're excited about that. I appreciate you know, Betty's uh, comments and compliments on the work that we're doing. When I hear that, I feel like I need to I need to pass that on. I got a couple of people here. It's, it's in our advisor, our accreditation advisory council, 
to do a lot of this work and help uh, help digest that and give us feedback and move that forward. We've got some great individuals. Half of our ARC this year is new. We've had some great new ARC members that are joining us that are positive, optimistic, and wanting to make that change. So, so I appreciate that, but we got a lot of support behind us. I want to talk now, we've, we've kind of delved into where are we, what's that current state? And we have to take an honest look at, at where you are, the good, the bad, the ugly, and then, this, and then decide where you go from there. So I want to talk to you about future state, both where we are now in addressing some issues and where we see ourselves going in the next year or two. We talk about now, we start with some things we've already talked about, those summer check-ins, and highly effective. We talked about o OVTs today. I, you know, I feel like we put a little bit um, uh, too much responsibility on our, on our outside visitation teams to make sure that this process is followed. Oftentimes, somebody will get to year five and get to year five, and maybe they aren't where they need to be. They haven't followed the process, whatever it is, and we hear about it first in year five, and we don't believe that that is how it needs to be working. But it's been the OBT who has been responsible for that. So we started off piloting this. Our goal is then to ramp this up, that we want to be able to offer that for every system, every year, a check-in. We're talking one hour of time to sit down with each individual system to say, where are you on, on, on the, the uh, process, where are you on the results, to walk through that, to advise, to get feedback, if they're off track, to get them back on track. To offer that for every for every system. We talked before about the support, the lining supports. When I see that, where we're really talking about intentionality, are we intentionally providing supports to every system? You know, you know, to to Ben's point where he says, "I hear one thing over here and one thing over here." Are we intentional about what supports are available? Good vetted supports we can provide to all systems. So we want to do uh, do that kind of tiered look at how we can provide help systems. Um, and providing that help. And then we've greatly increased this year the amount of training. We're doing training for OBTs, OBT members, OBT chairs. We've been meeting with systems. We've been providing a lot of that training, really trying to send that clear message. And we are sending a message to everyone about, about what the, the clarity of expectation is. Secondly, reduce that, that reporting uh, burden. And we set on years one through four. Uh, when you're in year five and you're in that accreditation year, last thing we want to do is go, well, we're changing something. So year five systems, we're going we're to continue with currently where we are. But with years one through four, we're going to reduce that reporting burden. And as Jay said, that, that right there would have been a huge gear had we done it by how many responses we had. Um, what we've asked systems to do, we've asked systems to follow a continuous approval process. You start with your needs assessment, you identify your goals based on it, you select your strategies, implement, collect feedback, and you're in that process. We so follow that process. You don't do it all every year, right? You don't do everything. You follow that process. So as you do that, we're saying, you know, you're, for, you're in the new year, you're selecting that, those goals based on a needs assessment process. But for reporting, we tell systems respond to everything every year, do the entire report, report every year. And then we tell OVTs to do the retire, entire report every year. So again, to, to Jay's point, we want the rigor not to be in the report. Focus in on where you are. If, it, if, you're, if you're at that stage where you're doing that needs assessment, you're doing that, that, uh, that goals identification, then focus in. And that's what you report on, is you report, or you report on that piece. So we're going to talk more about that here as we get into the future piece about community report. But, but Annie, you had a question. If they don't have any of the full reports the first year, how do they know what they're supposed to be working on? Like, if you remove foundational structures and, um, I mean, most of it's optional now. But if you don't have a report on all that stuff, what basis are they building their plan on? Yeah, I think we got to keep in mind that when we talk about continuous improvement process, we put it, we have it in a five-year process because every five years. We come in and we do that assessment piece. When I think about schools who just finished that and are going into uh, the second cycle, I consider them to be year six, not year okay, one. So, so they're they're following up. Years. Yeah, because they're yeah this. the process doesn't quit in five years; it right. continues. So as they go into that next year, they're determining what do we carry over, what worked well, what do we need to leave behind. Mm -hmm. Let's look at our data again. A really good, strong look at where we're at in the needs assessment. 
and to find those goals. But I'm not sure in year one we need to be asking them about their sustainability of those goals that they just identified. So we, we really wanted to align it. We can make systems we can align the reporting to where they are in the process. And so, go ahead. Sarah? If I can, um, when we are coaching schools on the needs assessment process, one of the assistive resources that we're asking them to look at is the financial assessment report. So mm -hmm. that if there is a gap they need to address and fill into their goals, that that is part of their needs assessment. And keeping in mind that for year five, they reported on all of those foundational structures. Um, and the likelihood that a big sweeping change is happening between A and, and, and today. Um, if there are, we've encouraged them to report that. But then we um, just saw it copying and pasting last year from last year. And when they have the thing on here about compliance, that they've got a compliance sheet to fill this section out, do we let them know then? Yeah, we do. We let them compliance know. will always be done annually. Yeah. But, um, but I think your point's well made, and, I, and we, we don't have a definitive response when we talk about when, when do we look at foundational structures. You know, how often do we look at sacred outcomes? I mean, those kind of things, about how, how often those come up in that uh, in that cycle to be reviewed, I think there's still questions to answer. And the needs assessment is the same needs assessment that fulfills mm -hmm. the K-12 chairs. Yes, thing. Yeah. that's one part of it. So yeah. when you say needs assessment. So we're not duplicating, we're not duplicating. Yeah. That's my systems have been really good about like we can do fulfill two or three do the same action once to fulfill two or three different things. Okay. And when we focus on that needs assessment piece, you know, we look we do we take that in, we take that into consideration. And part of what we do is providing people a lot of tools about how do you really do a good needs assessment, a good root cause analysis, how do you how do you perform that? But then that really gets translated into what we do with that legislative requirement. So the work gets done over here, we translate it into that document all the lines. Yes. Well, it gets back to, to what have you heard from districts. I know the people who work with Greenbush get a lot of support. I mean, they they need a form, they make up a form form like here's what here you can do this and that'll be your needs assessment. Here's you have to cover the school board, here's what it looks like. And then people who are OVPs in Greenbush territory who OVT and other territories are going, schools and other territories aren't getting the same kind of help. So how do we get those supports more consistent across the state? Such a good lead in to our next, to our next point, as we start talking about those things moving forward. So right now, that's right, that's right, we're keeping track. That uh, right now, so those summer check-ins is a good way to start that. And aligning supports is a good way to start that. But your point is right. How, how do we, you know, there's there's about five of us, six of us on our team. How do you get that to the entire field in a consistent messaging? And we're going to, we're going to start with this, and this will be something we'll be working on uh, moving into next year with this idea of regional executives. Right now, every bit of support that we do comes out of 900 Southwest Jackson, and we hope they're reading the emails and hope they're looking at the newsletters and everything goes out. And we all know hope is not a very good strategy. So we want to begin thinking about regional executives in the field. And we've identified um, four regions. Executives will serve, I think we we think it'll be about 60 systems per regional executive. But these are people who are who are KSE employees, will be in the field, someone in the southeast, northeast, southwest, northwest, who can be responsible for communicating with them, responsible for doing these, these check-ins, responsible for if they have issues, providing where that support is. But we are working across the state with people working in the field. We also want those people, to your point, to be working with the service centers in the area as well to begin aligning with them and those supports that they provide that we're all uh, getting that equally uh, across the state. So regional executives, you think, will be a really huge support for us. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Betty, to your point, as we laid those those quadrants out, both Jay and I said, you know, there are some really unique things to our urban and suburban districts. So Jay and I are going are to take on working with urban and suburban systems only, while these other four folks take the four quadrants across the state, and be that connective piece to the uh, to the field. So that's something we're really excited about moving forward. As we talked about this reporting thing up here, 
That comes down to this next bullet. We're looking at one cumulative report. So right now, if you're a school system, over a five-year process, you fill out five reports, the entire report every year. The OBT fills out five reports, the entire report every year, in addition to what you put in artifacts and everything else. So what we're talking about is if you're a system, if you're truly following that continuous improvement process, one cumulative report. In year one, this is a specific, there's, 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 it's fluid, but let's just say in year one, you're really doing your needs assessment and you're doing your goals and writing that place. That's where you report. That's what, that's what we review when it comes to us. That's what the, the regional executives will give feedback on. That's what OBTs will write on. So we do it all in one thing. And, and you, know, you go back into year two, where are we at? Well, the next part of the report is here are the strategies that we've selected. Here's, what, here's how we came up with those. Here is starting implementation, let's say. And that goes into year two, but it's all within the same report. We don't need a separate report for OBTs. We need the OBT feedback to be embedded in the same report that the system has. So for them, it's ease of use. I can go back, here's where we were, here's what they suggested, and we started embedding those things in, uh, together. So it takes a lot of that redundancy out. It takes a lot of the confusion out, and every system has one report. I think it'll probably be easier for you as well, you know, if you look at any of the reports that come your way. So, um, so that part is really critical. The other things, and this goes to what, what Sarah was saying, I'm really excited about this for, for the purpose of clarity. Because systems don't always know when you have a foundational structure that whatever it is, tier frameworks is poor, they don't always know exactly what that's supposed to look like, right? So what we'd like to do is on this cumulative, cumulative report for the star recognition, we have rubrics for that. We have rubrics in place for foundational structures. We have rubrics in place for what defines a good, uh, you know, a process. So we would like to start thinking about embedding those into the document. So if I am thinking the star recognition and the commissioner and I have talked about this several times, we've got these fantastic rubrics in place that are optional. That you might choose to apply for star, you might not, but if you don't, you may never even go and look at the rubrics. The rubrics provide us a standard the standard of excellence. So if you're a four in all those rubrics, you're really rocking it. You might be a one and go, we have places to grow. But we want to embed these rubrics into our document as a self-evaluation. Self-evaluating your system against the standard. Then you can provide the evidence that you use, the data that you use, the artifacts you've uploaded that show how you came to that rating. But it gives everyone a, a, a clarity around each of the state board outcomes. We'll do the same thing with foundational structures. Again, thanks to the AAC, they develop those and they are excellent. So someone can go in there and they can look at the foundational structures, do a self-assessment, and then they then they have uh, the ability to upload the artifacts, their data, their narrative to support how they got to that point. So this all starts to go into this one cumulative report that we think provides clarity, reduces the amount of reporting, and is consistent with a continuous improvement process. And then lastly, there's this whole issue we talked about earlier. What is quality evidence? So in our regulations around key said you must have, <clears throat> excuse me, you must have quality, what is, what is quality evidence of a continuous improvement process? It sounds good, but we haven't necessarily identified it very tight. There's still that level of subjectivity. And let's be honest, there probably will always be some level of subjectivity but we have right now a, a process group, a growth group. We also have a compliance group who are looking into these areas of what constitutes evidence of. Michelle Muller used to always say, "Is evidence by what?" I used to love what she would say that. Um, so, what evidence? What evidence do we have of process of growth? And how are we all looking at it in a consistent manner? And that's the piece that we're looking at right now, or meeting uh, currently to define what those are. So that's our future state from now and where we look at going in the next year or so. Yes, Anne? But our rubrics for growth, say in academics, is different from STAR, right? The STAR just says you got 59% grade four. That's not the thesis given, right? No. Okay. So we will actually we actually want to embed. If you go to if you go to our STAR uh, site, you follow, website, you follow up any of those qualitative 
areas. Mm -hmm. Let's just say social and emotional learning, or social emotional growth. You can pull up a PDF and it shows the exact rubric. Right. That is, and we want to we want to embed that rubric in these cumulative reports. So as systems are, what we end up having too many times is we get the 35 page report with these long narrative from the system. And I'll just be transparent. We're just throwing everything at it, hoping that something sticks. Because we haven't told them what does it really look like? What should it look like? Well, These really provide that that standard to compare with. The, the ones that are um, what are qualitative. qualitative, we have rubrics, and the ones that are quantitative, we don't. Other Correct. than 59% get you a gold or whatever. Correct. Yeah. But the, the rubric, your development, would be to give them something they could say, yes, I'm showing evidence of growth for key skills. Yes. Because I don't want to start a big key skill. No, 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 no. And I, oh, I see where you're at. No, no. We think that process is, is beneficial to everyone. If someone, you know, if, if, if people choose to apply for STAR, don't apply for STAR, we tell people all the time, just use the group. If you choose to apply that, it, it, you know, that, that's optional. But the benefit of, of knowing what the standard is for all those qualitative areas is critical. Right. And our thought is, now I need to speak for myself, my thought is, if we do those qualitative qualitative areas really, really well, you'll see that quantitative quantitative areas start to go. That that one kind of feeds the other, that yeah, relationship between the two. The question I was asking was that uh, academic growth and got a star award doesn't mean you get accredited. Because we've already seen where no. we gave conditional accreditation to no. somebody who got a bronze or something. Yeah, no, there's no, there's certainly not a hundred percent alignment. There. <laughs> but we do, we do feel like that in response to systems saying we don't know what you expect, we need clarity. That we get this provides clarity around what quality kindergarten readiness program or quality IPS system would look like. By embedding it here, they can do a self reflection and respond to that with their own data, their own narratives, and artifacts. Great question. So you're talking about a year or two years down the road to get all of this implemented. Did I understand? We're starting this right now. Right. This part moving forward, we'd like to have this in place in 23, 24. Now, the good news, and I think if, I think at some point, I'm going to go off in this rabbit hole, at some point we have to start looking at, at equalization of systems. We just say 179 this year. Next year we have, I believe, eight. You know, we're going to want to do that, but you know, when you have eight next year, it's kind of a nice year to try something new with some, with some stuff coming through and make sure we have all that we need to be. But we would like to have this ready um, in 23, 24 school year. And this is, this is being communicated to? We have just posted the regional executive position, but we really haven't talked much about the regional executive model including the, the regions and the cohorts. And so that's what we're, we're <clears throat> doing a lot of planning, a lot of talking about it. We have not shared a plan. And in those cohorts, <clears throat> Myron mentioned that there would be an urban suburban. There really is an urban, and that would include the Dodges and the Wimbledon and things. And there's the suburban. So there really is two groups that, that somewhat are yeah. a little bit different in the region. You also have somebody working on a growth model, right? That's going to be what is. I wonder if there's anybody in the room that's doing it. Jake, Jake Steele, talk a little bit about what you're working on. Yeah, the regs, the regs are very clear that we need to have evidence for two things. So we're identifying what is that evidence. How do we have an objective enough that we can lead along the way, right? And then theory is that we are we are with you and we can see. So there's a fair amount of pieces into what does that look like, what things do we make and things like that. So we do a big analysis uh, throughout the agency and then let those be written into the ordinance um, as well. So the, the idea of evidence of, I guess I'm trying to discern what I'm seeing, how many options we have to look at, what are you I mean, so that's one of the things we're considering. 
right now we care deeply about post-secondary effectiveness. We also care very deeply about what are the things, what does the research say along the way is the greatest evidence that helps us get there? What are the indicators that have the strongest correlation research-wise? Is it third grade reading? Is it, you know, what are those things? And so right now we're digging through the research to identify are there key indicators along the way that are helping us uh, have the strongest prediction of having um, you know, success in, in um, post-secondary effectiveness? So our focus is on post-secondary And I, I, I asked that question. So when we talk about post-secondary effectiveness, you know, the question is to me is that we have looked at one of the things we talked about is not everybody. Success right out the shoot. Or, and, and I, I, somebody proved me up yesterday that post secondary is not all for engineering, but it's a two year. Um, so I was separating it yeah. out. So I, I got that clarification on that. I'm wondering if you were going to incorporate um, those success areas that are right out of the shoot, not going on two years. So cosmetology, uh, nurses aide, uh, CNA, well, two year associate degree, all of those count. Any of those. But, but Jake's also working on what is growth, you know, so you mentioned, what if I cannot, and mentioned the star, what if I'm not a goal? And all, and, I, and if you tell me that it's too high, that, is, that I can't ever get there. You mentioned, you know, I'll give you a million dollars if you lose 40 pounds in the next 15 minutes. Well, that isn't gonna happen. If you look at someone that's at, at an academic level, students at three and four of 5%, and you said we want you to be at 75. So you know, well, shut down. But the question then is, what would be appropriate growth over the next three to five years? And Jake's also working on that. And, and I guess the, one of the things you're talking about is improving the perspective of the fact that we started looking at the two years. I mean, I really think it's great that that's now added in. What I'm saying is, are there not students that can be pulled out of high school and can be have success? Um, if they had a certificate, but not in high school, that would count. But what, I mean, if all they have is their diploma, what are they going to do? No. So our goal is 70%. Okay. So the 30% that do not achieve it. Can be successful. We don't. We don't have any way to measure. Okay. We don't have any way to okay. measure. Okay. So that's the problem. It's, it's, we don't have any no way, way to measure. measure. Yeah. Okay. So that would include military, taking over family business. If I've started my own. I'm unemployed. We don't have any way to measure. So we never said 100. percent We've gone to the Georgetown data that says that the economy needs 70 to 75. So that's the level we'd like for you to be at. And then what we have to measure is, in one measure, where, where am I at now? So a big urban system may be at 30%, we want them at 70. What in the next cycle would be appropriate growth for them to be at, given where they start? I guess for me, we talked about the future. You have to start So there 
it is a map to success that did not involve this two year certificate or whatever, but it's still significant. So we just dismiss that because don't, we can't. Don't and dismiss it. That should be honored in someone's individual plan. Of state. 4% of Kansas kids, on average, are going to enlist in the military. So you more, account for that. More in Fort Leavenworth and Gary County, right? That's the overall. So in the IPS, we say, you're going to go to the military, we got to get you physically fit, right? To pass basic training. We got to get your ASVAC score at the level that you want. We got to get you to the recruiter. But it doesn't show up in that success measure because the military doesn't give us that. We don't we don't negate it. From a teaser perspective, I can tell you assistants do a fantastic job with the family their story. We ask you to first question on the teaser application is tell your story. I guarantee you, you go and you look at Little Liver Gary County, this is part of the story they tell. Because they know that the that the military military is including that country, you don't have access to that teacher. But they will tell you the story of their system, and and and, and from a, the arch perspective, they they're, they're paying attention. They see that they take those things into consideration, so it's all part of one holistic picture. Forty percent they trailed because they had one kid who went to the military that was seventy percent right. difference. And and what's so critical is this understanding because, like I said, I I don't. And so it kind of came together when I understood that. So I appreciate your well, part of patience in answering my question. I'll say one more thing because I, I can, I don't want to get off this because it's exciting to talk about this. But, um, you know, we talked earlier about uh, someone at the table of mission, as Sarah followed up on you, starting with that end in mind. I think it was Ben was talking about the outcomes, that outcomes approach, starting with the end in mind. So we're talking right now about this end mission. Starting with that end in mind, and how do we get there? And that's why I think kind of exciting about a lot of the work that Jay's doing, is, Jay, as Jake is doing, is Jake is. Uh, I was yeah, gonna say, you're doing great don't, work too, Jay. Don't be something like that. Okay. <laughs> great work too. That we work with Jay with Kay over here. That Jake is doing uh, is looking not just the outcomes. What are those key indicators, critical lessons that we know move us toward that? I know yesterday, if I remember right, there was some talk about a chronic asthma treatment. We know that's one of the big indicators. There are things that we can look at as we go to get that data on that are going to push us toward those outcomes. So it's all kind of coming together in this one holistic piece for piece of it. We're really excited. Well, the question I brought up yesterday is starring conflict with peace. And the only concern I have about putting the star thing in the accreditation report is like for example you could get a low level star for academics but get conditionally accredited because it just wasn't that good or it didn't show growth so I don't want schools to be confused about that or you may have gotten a, a low star or a low secondary but it's way below where you ought to be you're not going to get you know full accreditation if that's where you are but another thing I think we need to address is we hear from a lot of systems about, again, it's clear, it's transparency. What is it you're looking for? What do you want? I feel like this provides transparency that they maybe don't like to have before. To be able to have that right there in the self the self evaluation without having to guess what is it for me. Well, this does. One time assessment, and we see some kind of reward at the end. So, this really is more in line with you're not just taking a picture of you today, and that's it. It's more mm -hmm. uh, cumulative. Mm -hmm. So, I applaud that. Thank you. All right. Well, our last slide um, for you today is really focused as a 
as a celebration um, of, of what's been happening on our team and the support that we've been able to provide for systems. So we know that we've heard loud and clear that don't want to build the plane while we're flying. Um, but as a team, we know that there is already a plane in the air and we have to make sure it is, it is moving safely forward while we are redesigning that interior to make it um, a better experience for all involved. And so this slide just really outlines the work that we've been able to sustain while planning uh, for that future. So this is the plan we're executing on that, that's been in place but we, we are still looking forward, engaging in that planning process. So just kind of some highlights of what we've been able to do these last um, eight months that we've been a team. 92 systems have moved through the accreditation process. We had summer check-ins with 30 systems individually with, with another one today. We hosted a beginning of the year kickoff for systems, which was a new uh, experience for everybody. Uh, we hosted our OVP member and chair training. We've been actively working through our PISA regional training pilot with five meetings last year and two meetings this year. We onboarded eight new ARC members and conducted a full day ARC training. And we've continued to meet with our accreditation advisory council. On top of all of that, we are actively preparing for the 179 systems that will be coming before the board this year. We have three internal work groups that we are facilitating to help provide some clarity and definition for process. So what is that relationship between STAR and, and, and PISA uh, and the relationship there, defining growth and the measures to eliminate some of that subjectivity and also shoring up the work around compliance to make sure that um, we're not um, catching a system in year five when we might have had some opportunities to intervene with them earlier. So we have those three work groups going. We're also actively working to build a new authenticated application. If we want to have one cumulative report, the app needs to be built to support that. So we're working with IT to build this new application with the hope that we can pilot it next year uh, with, some, with, with a small group of systems with a full rollout being that next year. Um, we are preparing to onboard regional executives, so having three additional employees that will be working across the state, making sure that we're welcoming them and bringing them into a really intentional process and, and team structure. And we're also working on that transition timeline for how the reporting changes will roll out, how that application will roll out, how STAR will transition through all of that as well, and how we might reorder those systems. So a lot of work that we're sustaining, and then a lot of new work that we are we are planning as a team. So we just wanted to kind of showcase um, the, the work of our team these last few months. And I'm going to turn it back to you guys. Well, we want to provide you a little bit of time for Q and A. <clears throat> We're all being so quiet. I'm really kind of concerned about this now. I know you've asked some as we've gone along. So is, does anybody have any? burning questions that they'd like Indeed. to talk through. And this is completely different than anything they said today. Uh, I know that, I, I don't forgotten what we call it, I used to be in CA. Uh, Cogni? Cogni. Cogni. I've always been concerned from the very process, beginning of this process, that the school districts choose their own teams. In Cogni? No. Or just the OBT? No, because they don't. You're saying mm -hmm. those, and I, I'm wondering if that weakens the credibility. If I chose my friend to be the the chair, so when we, I'm not asking you to change. I'm asking. No. You, this, I think this is important to discuss. But if we want it, how objective is my next door neighbor? If I'm going to be his or her OBP chair, I, I've talked to enough superintendents that said, well. We chose my next door neighbor who I'm, you know, friends with as our OBT chair. And so our OBTs get together. We really just share ideas, but we're, we've got each other's backs, right? Um, you know, and I think there's, there could be some conflict of interest in that, but that's in the context of the OBT role as it's been. We're looking at changing that role. I mean, I, we've talked to several OBT chairs who said, I feel personally responsible for a system being conditionally accredited because they're owning too much of it. 
because they're reporting on all of it for the first four years. That's really the only group that's reporting out. So we're, we're moving to these annual check-ins with KSDE. We're taking some, a lot more of that accountability to us. And then what we hear from OBTs is they love the OBT model because they get to go and see somebody doing something different and they can take things back to their district. What we need to do is identify what does the OBT need to provide feedback on for that system in a manner that, that works for both. So we're moving towards that. I don't know if that answers your question. And I like the idea that we're trained <clears throat> not wait till the fifth year to have that continuous process. There's a difference between this department that I was used to in the first two terms of my career and another state where the uh, Department of Education sort of played gotcha. Uh, and, and a major difference that I saw when I got to Kansas was that this department tried to find problems early and fix them before, before you got to a gotcha stage. And what I've seen by developing those relationships and concerns earlier is that philosophy to continue because our goal would be for 286 school districts to be legitimately accredited. Mm -hmm. and, and that can only be done with uh, with early identification and professional development. Yep. And so I've always applauded this department uh, all since I've been here for having that philosophy. Just a question on how Cognia is different now. When when it was North Central and Advanced Ed, the OBT actually determined whether it was conditionally accredited or not. There was no arc in North Central. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, they just did it. They just took on this other job of deciding if their neighbors were going to be accredited, and then they sent that straight to the state. So today under PISA, do the OBTs or the schools make that recommendation, or they just send it to the ARC? They send it to the ARC. But right now, if you're a if you're a cognitive system, um, well, you know, like with the NCAA or the yeah. advanced ed, you can go through cognitive and you can get a cognitive accreditation and be an accredited school by good, very good accrediting organizations, and just choose not to be. State accredited by, by KSDE. That's okay. Some schools will do that. Some schools will go, you know, we want to do, and it's not all private schools, by the way. We have several public schools that also go through cognitive. Schools who want that cognitive accreditation because it is a, it's a rigorous process, it's a state or state process. It's very well done. I've personally have gone through that training and been on some visits, and it's a very good process. Um, so, what we do is we say, if you want to be accredited by, by the state as well, we will accept your approval process because we know it's good. And we'll accept that in. We, we adopt that. We, we look through that. We can still comment on it. We can still ask questions about it. But that's what we look at. And then there's other things that you have to do with admission. You have to be accountable for the state board outcomes. You have to be accountable for the elements of a successful high school grant. So there are uh, foundational structures. So there are things on there we ask them to report on that aren't included in their process. That makes it holistic. That whole thing goes to the ARC. We have individuals on the ARC who have a lot of experience with Cognant, particularly private systems that use Cognant to kind of help us with that process. But it's uh, it's well articulated. It's really the big difference is as we pull that process in, how are they addressing the, the, the state board outcomes, foundational structure, those things that would not necessarily be present in their structure. But it does go to the ARC and the ARC is. Mm -hmm. I guess one of the things that I'm still concerned about and been asking for a while, and I don't ever want to have this happen, but if you have it out there, it's like the classroom. If you put out a consequence, we prefer to carry it out, right? <laughs> That's like 101. Um, you know, we have non-accreditation. What do we do? You know, we talked about conditional accreditation. We don't need that. So what do we do with the district that the board decides to vote for non-accreditation. You will have three to five, three to four or five. The board would have to decide. Yeah. One of them 
you can take the school district vote. The state of Kansas can run. Kansas City, Missouri had that happen to them what, 40 years ago, 50, 40 years ago. Yeah. Uh, that was a very good level of success. So I'm not saying you don't have it. You could, you could, uh, ask, you could um, ask the legislature to not fund the district. You could dissolve the school district. You could give them time to improve uh, even more after they've done. You'll have options. And my guess is you will face that somewhere in the next five to eight years. The board will face somebody that hasn't been able to attend to the needs. I think we've talked about it'll be probably a system that just has gone through so many different changes and boards and leadership that things have just fallen to the way. That's my guess. But hopefully not. Hopefully not. You know what that would be if you prepared for that. You look at states, and Jake can probably speak to this a lot because he studied. There's not a lot of good models for what you do when what whatever that school district is gets to whatever level they call no good. The, the success of moving them out becomes really, really hard. And I don't know. Do you know of any states that have been successful in taking over the district? So the only one example that you could ever even close to saying was successful was Lawrence in Massachusetts, but just to give an example of how bad that was, they also did a district called Holyoke, and we wouldn't call that a great success, and then recently Boston Public Schools, 40,000 students who were just up, had all the right reasons to have a state takeover, and they uh, churned and churned and churned to find these contracts and said, we're not taking it over. Uh, my opinion is because they knew that if they took it over, there was they, they weren't going to be able to pull Boston out of it any better than and this is Massachusetts, this is Massachusetts one of the states that has no state recognition of the Double check. Is that it? I, I, Jen, I'm going to stretch you a little bit. At its peak, Kansas City, Missouri, did it have 40,000 kids in it? Oh, it did. Yeah. And it has 16,000 right. today. No, when I heard that, when I was a teacher, she did So, what happened? A, a churn started, you had boards corrupt. Oh. Yeah, the takeover of school superintendents were different every year. Yeah. It, it was a long, so I'd say, go to your, your, if we end up with a conditionally or a non credit school, everyone in this state has failed. That's, that system failed. We have failed. I mean, everyone has failed because there's no good answer at that point. That's why we should do everything we can try to get them to improve before you get I mean, I, you have a stick to do that, but it's not an effective stick at improving that the system. And if that student, if that school is one with 100 students, five schools within 20 miles, that's easy. Yeah. But if you had to take over one, that's not easy. That's an easy case. And you worked a little bit in that. I tried, helped, tried to help you. Actually, one of my assignments, right, the job I had around four years was, professional development center and it was a the whole there are nine of us and we all work together and we did work in the Kansas City, Missouri School District and the Kingston School District, both were unaccredited. And both of them had complete dysfunctional leadership. Absolutely dysfunctional leadership. They had three superintendents at the one time in Kansas City, Missouri, because they'd hire one and give them a three year contract and then fire them in three months and then hire another one, give them a three-year contract and fire them in a few months. And so I thought that would be an excellent job for me to have. Yeah. I am completely dysfunctional. It was, it was dysfunctional leadership. And I suppose they all got some sort of severance cut. They all got full salary for three years. <laughs> Frankly, in my opinion, it was all four years. I didn't know how they were up for it. was so unique. I believe you all the four months. Yeah, thank you. Do they have to go have one of their check or check? Yeah. Yep. I'll be happy to finish it. Oh no, I, I I told them I'd stay, so they're well, let me give you one example. That's a good question. Kansas City the one time the school Northwest Northwest High School. Uh and they this is the way they did professional development in the Kansas City Missouri School District. The office decided 
the main office decided uh, they'd, bring, they'd bring people in to do professional development. And they would assign a certain number from each school without any impact, any input from the teachers, without any impact from the administration. You'd just get an assignment. Send these four people to this professional development. Right. And yes. that's... So it didn't have anything to do with these. If, if you're a teacher, you just get told what's yeah. going Yeah, and, you you and, and likely you wouldn't get told. You probably wouldn't get assigned anything. It was just completely yeah, dysfunctional. We spent yeah. days there. I just got... I, I was appalled every time I walked in the building. Through the only medical director. Uh, and I'll get off this pretty soon. <laughs> and every other door was open, propped open for kids to go out and smoke. The only safe door was the one they made us go in. <laughs> and the superintendent was just amazing. It was a swing and ball. But it was amazing. You can't tell me every one of those superintendents was that bad. <laughs> I'm sure one of them was good. <laughs> Dr. Watson, if what you're saying is an accurate prediction of the future in terms of population, then, then we have to act now to basically have everyone in every district buy in to the fact that they are responsible and own the, these issues and that we need to cooperate with each other to, to strengthen those districts rather than waiting till they get to that precipice and say, that district's going to have to come from something. I think that work needs to be now. Agreed, I agree. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just, you know, yeah. We're, we're, <laughs> oh yeah, we can, but we, we ask that exact question all the time, Dan. We ask that all the time. Well, and but I so, appreciate it because this is the most clear answer I've gotten yeah. to this point. I know we've been through a lot. But, you know, I agree. We, it starts now. So was, go ahead. <clears throat> I think you're probably going to say it. Well, no, maybe not. Was this helpful to you in getting to deeper understanding of where they are now and the roadmap that they're laying out to go forward? Probably was not. What it was you not. Okay, so go ahead. Um, well, I was going to ask, why did you make that statement? What if, if you're looking to the future? What what is in your future? Because I see such a churn in some school districts of board leadership, principal, superintendent leadership, where they have a different person every year, and it's just kind of keeping doors open, but nothing's transpiring. And when you go in and you even say, I'll say, let's keep it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's hard, you know, if we're, if we're talking about improvement. Um, so, the check-ins, I mean, the check-ins, the regional manager, somebody on the ground that's checking, you know, in the future on these districts, connecting them with the resources that we have in the state from service centers to our TASM network, et cetera, is going to be critical. But at the end of the day, Gene, they have to know that they own that. We can help them, but they've got to stabilize their own system and however they want to do that. Um, and it gets tragic, it's always tragic, not only, but it really is tragic when you take a size of Kansas City, Missouri and watch that happen to the thousands of kids that were in that system. But, okay. but they own, you know, you're talking about the educators and the people in that district own the district. It's, it's the community that owns that mm -hmm. district and is responsible for the issues that are arising. And, and that needs to be transferred to, to those folks so that they're aware that they have that responsibility, N not just um, not just saying, well, it's the teachers and the educators that have caused this problem. It, it's it's a, a result uh, of a problem in the community, not not the initiation of the problem in the district. And I really think that somehow we have to elevate the issue of teacher. Um, recruitment and retention and, and the really seriousness of, of that problem right now because that is, is uh, going out into all these different areas of lots and lots and lots of problems. It's, a, it's almost a, 
a virus in, in student learning, and in uh, accreditation, and in all sorts of other areas. And STEM's position is so narrow. But we haven't really highlighted that as much as we'd like to. And, and I'm really pleased with the fact that you've gone to yearly check-ins. We've done that for financial purposes for mm -hmm. a long time. And for the first time I'm hearing the department put as much emphasis on academic and in-class instruction as much as making sure they don't get in trouble on their budget. Yeah. And now it's marrying those two together where they both go side by side, because they should. Mm -hmm. They really should. Mm -hmm. And to have that emphasis, I think, is, is wonderful and a great piece uh, to that. This should be my, this should be the end of my program. You should be leaving before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 There are a lot of people that really want to see public education go by the wayside. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. And if that's their goal, then, then no one is interested in whether they are being accredited or not. The idea is we want to see the failure. The biggest problem that I am seeing is Wichita, because you'd be surprised with the very ones that are advocating for the dissolution of public education are probably those that could not afford to send their children to private schools or, or whatever. So much has gotten in this level that public education will never meet your child's needs. And so we need to start looking at other areas. You cannot rely on the assumption that there are people that want to keep this institution intact because it is being attacked with so much vim and vigor, people who will believe that, first of all, teachers don't care about your kids. Um, they want to vilify teachers, schools, what the whole goal is about. And I'm not sure what the, what the end purpose is. There are a lot of people that are buying into that, and they think that there's this, if we get rid of this, there's this silver bullet awaiting us. But no one has ever identified that silver bullet for them. So when we look at, uh, as an example, getting board members that really care about education, whether students moving on, or are they there for one issue? If We've elected a board because the big issue, I'm going to use this example, is math. And that's all they know. And that's all they care about. And they're there. And once that's resolved, we no longer need that, then what do they do? There's no passion. There's no commitment. There's no whatever. The idea that we have to communicate and create a stronger community buy-in to public education, to what the purpose of public education serves, and the fact that there are so many kids that go through public education that can tell the same level of success that you will see in private school. And, and, and people aren't seeing that. They don't, they don't realize that this is what's going on. So we often talk about the message that we're putting out there. And the message that public education is still hopeless and strong is so desperately needed, uh, not only from uh, educators, but from parents, students. Um, and I'll take my offer. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah. if there was <clears throat> Uh, we really appreciate the time to come and share the work that we're doing. We feel the support. We know you have high expectations, but we appreciate the support as well. Ben and Randy, all the support they provide us. 
it's really, it's, it's great. We've got a lot of work ahead of us, for sure. But if there was an accreditation system for eating while working, you guys would get it, okay? <laughs> Fully accredited working lunch, because I didn't even notice you eat the food. You guys are just so working so hard. So, well done. You had to be able to eat, but it's convenient. Thank you. I'm going to try to eat. Practicing hot dogs. I'll tell you, you'll take care of all this. Yep. It was all a good team. Oh, just.